A shift in the Galactic Council, as the iridescent light from the luminous stars streamed through the arched windows of the Galactic Council chamber, a somber mood hung in the air. Each representative from countless races across the cosmos sat on the edge of their seats, their hearts heavy with anticipation. The recent events involving the Veritans and humans had sent shockwaves through the galaxy, their repercussions still echoing through the council halls. At the heart of the council chamber, Ambassador Solane, the human representative, sat nursing his wounds, both physical and emotional. He was a figure of sympathy, having survived a recent assassination attempt. His survival and return to the council only solidified his image as a resilient and committed leader. Yet, the scars on his face were a grim reminder of the Veritans' treachery. On the opposite end of the chamber sat Ambassador Varro, the Veritan representative. His features were hardened, his expression resolute. He was a warrior at heart, representing a proud race of fighters. Yet, his current predicament weighed heavily on him. His people were vilified, their reputation in ruins. The recent attack on a human vessel by a rogue Veritan faction had only deepened the chasm between the two races. The council session began, the speakers voicing their concerns, one after the other. When it was Solane's turn, he stood, his presence filling the chamber. Honorable members of the council, he began, the humans have been the victims of an unprovoked attack by the Veritans. This is not an isolated incident, but a pattern of aggression that we have borne witness to. His words echoed around the chamber, a tangible reminder of the human's plight. He recounted the bombing attempt on their flagship, the resurgence, and the subsequent attack on their vessel by a Veritan ship. The memory of these events still hung heavy in the chamber. As he concluded his speech, he turned to look directly at Ambassador Varro. We had started on a path of friendship, Varro, he said, his voice heavy with regret. It's a shame that it has come to this. Varro met Solane's gaze, a mixture of frustration and regret in his eyes. Indeed, Solane, he replied. We both know that there are forces in our respective worlds that do not want peace, that thrive in chaos and destruction. He paused, then continued, but I assure you, the Veritans are not the villains here. We are victims too, of a game that we are yet to fully comprehend. As the council broke for recess, the murmurs of discussion filled the chamber. The stage was set, and the seeds of dissent were sown. The galaxy was on the brink of a war, a conflict that could ravage the cosmos and change the face of the Galactic Council forever. The question was, who would make the next move? Who would tip the scales towards peace or push them into the abyss of war? The call to arms. Back in Veritan space, the situation was tense. The once proud Veritan fleet lay dormant, their powerful warships floating like lifeless specters against the backdrop of distant stars. It was an ominous sight, a stark contrast to the bustling energy that usually defined Veritan space. Within the war rooms of the Veritan command center, high-ranking officers huddled around holographic screens. Their faces were stern, their gaze focused on the myriad of blips representing human ships strategically positioned around their territory. The images served as a constant reminder of the human's silent takeover, their insidious creep into Veritan sovereignty. Supreme Admiral Kever, the Veritan military's highest ranking official, stood in the middle of the room, his brow furrowed in deep thought. The Veritans were a race of warriors, and he was a warrior through and through. Yet, he found himself in a predicament that he had never anticipated. His fleet was immobilized, his warriors disheartened, and his enemies encroaching on Veritan space. Admiral, our fleet is still intact. Our warriors are ready to fight, said Commander Verrix, breaking the tense silence in the room. We cannot let the humans dictate our fate. You're right, Verrix, Admiral Kever replied. We've been dormant for too long. It's time we showed the humans the might of the Veritans. Thus, a clandestine operation was set into motion. A group of their most elite warriors was assembled for a strategic strike against the humans. Their target was a human command ship positioned at the outskirts of Veritan space. Their objective was simple, to make a powerful statement, to prove that the Veritans were far from defeated. Meanwhile, back at the Galactic Council, Ambassador Varro received a coded message. His eyes widened as he read the message. The Veritan military was preparing for a strike. He understood the gravity of the situation, yet he couldn't shake off a feeling of grim satisfaction. His people were fighting back. As the council session resumed, Ambassador Varro addressed the council, honorable council members, the Veritans have been silent, we've been patient. But we cannot stand by while our sovereignty is threatened. His voice echoed around the chamber, a plea, a warning. The Galactic Council let the humans have strategically positioned their ships around our territory. They've taken up peacekeeping roles without our consent. 
This is a blatant power play, a clear violation of our sovereignty. His voice grew stronger, more determined. We demand the immediate withdrawal of human forces from Veritan space. Or else, I fear we might be heading towards a war that no one wants. The council chamber fell silent, the weight of Varro's words sinking in. The Veritans had drawn a line in the sand, their patience wearing thin. The council had to make a decision, to take a stand. The future of the galaxy hinged on their next move. Little did they know, back in Veritan space, the wheels of war had already been set in motion. The Veritans were not waiting for the council's decision. They were taking matters into their own hands. The first strike, as the galactic council chamber thrummed with fervent debate and concealed threats, the boundless void of Veritan space was preparing to host the first act of defiance. A small, agile Veritan strike team, led by Commander Verrix, flawlessly carried out their mission, slipping through the icy vacuum in stealth cruisers. They aimed for the human command ship, the Vanguard. Their orders were unambiguous, deal a devastating blow to the humans, the opening gambit in the war that was on the horizon. Unaware of the brewing storm, the crew of the Vanguard went about their duties, their surveillance equipment revealing nothing more than the endless expanse of twinkling stars. They were on the periphery of Veritan territory, far removed from the central fleet. Their defenses were lowered, complacency had crept in. Commander Varix's team was ready. They had approached the Vanguard unnoticed. The tension on the bridge of the Veritan cruiser was palpable. Each team member grasped the gravity of their mission. This was more than a strike against the humans. It was the first repost in the Veritan's fight back. Determination etched their faces. There was no retreat. Fire, ordered Verrix, his voice a chilling calm. The cruiser's weapon systems vibrated to life, a barrage of high-energy torpedoes cutting through the void towards the oblivious vanguard. They hit with savage force, piercing the human ship's shields like gossamer, jarring the colossal vessel with a succession of thunderous explosions. Aboard the vanguard, turmoil ensued. Alarms blared, lights flickered, and crew members tumbled as the ship tilted ominously. Captain Griggs, struggling to maintain his balance, hollered commands to his crew, his face reflecting shock and incredulity. They were unprepared, their ship critically wounded. The Veritans had delivered the first punch. Back at the Galactic Council, news of the attack spread rapidly. The Galactic Council, still in session, was shocked by the audacious strike. Ambassador Solain stood, reeling from the report he was receiving. He had underestimated the Veritans. He'd assumed that their bravado on the Galactic Council was mere posturing. He was mistaken. The Veritans, they've attacked the Vanguard, Solane murmured, his voice barely a whisper. He could sense the unease around him, the waves of shock and rage radiating through the room. War was no longer a distant threat. It was an imminent reality. The Veritan attack marked the onset of a conflict that risked engulfing the galaxy. The Galactic Council was in disarray, alliances tested and strained. In the eye of the storm were two erstwhile friends, Ambassadors Solane and Varro, their friendship threatening to fracture under the burden of their duties. As news of the successful strike reached Veritan space, a wave of somber satisfaction swept over Supreme Admiral Kever. The operation was a success, the initial blow delivered, the initial stand made. The Veritans were not vanquished. They were just gearing up. However, despite the minor victory, Kever couldn't shake off a sense of impending disaster. War wasn't a solution. It was a cataclysm that would alter the face of the galaxy, leave wounds that would take millennia to heal. The Veritans were a warrior race, but they were not warmongers. They sought peace, harmony, a place among the stars. But the humans had provoked them, cornered them. They had left them with no alternative. Deep in space, the stars silently watched the shifting tide. A war was coming. The galaxy would never be the same again. The standoff, the Galactic Council Chamber hummed with tension. The news of the strike against the Vanguard still echoed through the room. Alliance lines were drawn and redrawn in hushed whispers, and the gears of war began to grind in the corridors of power across the galaxy. Ambassador Varro, draped in the vibrant hues of his native Veritan attire, took the floor. He was not a warrior, but a diplomat. Yet, in these desperate times, he found himself standing firm for his people, justifying an act of aggression. The Veritan Empire did not instigate this situation, he declared, his voice steady despite the underlying tension. We sought a diplomatic resolution. Our appeals for equality, for respect of our sovereignty, were dismissed. Around him, murmurs of agreement rippled from his allies, the Gorgons and Kolorans. The Council had become a stage for interstellar politics, a powder keg ready to ignite. 
In response, Ambassador Solane rose, his expression a mask of calm determination. He was well versed in the delicate dance of diplomacy, and the lives of countless citizens of New Terran now depended on his skills. The humans did not strike first, he said, meeting Varro's gaze. We have suffered losses, we have been provoked. Yet, we have acted with restraint. The attack on the vanguard was unprovoked and serves to show the true intentions of the Veritans. The Veritans can't forget their human cull. The Veritans only want humanity eradicated, even now. The room fell silent. The weight of the situation pressed down upon every delegate, every observer. The galaxy stood on the brink of a massive conflict, and this chamber was the fulcrum. Outside the council chambers, fleets began to mobilize. In Veritan space, Supreme Admiral Kever rallied his forces, their sleek ships ready to defend their homeland. Across the light years, in the shipyards of New Terra, a similar scene unfolded. The humans, their pride stung by the surprise attack, prepared their response. The stage was set for a confrontation that could define the course of the galaxy. Despite the looming threat, both Varro and Solane made a final attempt to quell the rising tide of war. In a private conversation away from the cacophony of the council, they spoke as friends, as beings who wished for peace. I did not want this, Solane, Varro said, his voice heavy with regret. I know, Solane responded. Neither did I, but their personal feelings were swept aside by the surge of conflict. The attack on the vanguard had pushed both races past the point of no return. Their friendship gone, their trust shattered. They stood on opposite sides of a divide that grew wider with every passing moment. The Galactic Council Chamber buzzed with the echoes of countless debates, the calls for war drowning out the pleas for peace. As Solane returned to the chamber, he found himself faced with an ominous holographic display of the galaxy, Veritan, and human territories highlighted in stark contrast. His fleet was approaching the Veritan border. Back in the Veritan space, Admiral Kever stood on the bridge of his flagship, the Praetorian, staring at a similar display. He could see the silhouettes of the human ships moving towards the Veritan territory. His heart pounded in his chest. The galaxy held its breath. The Veritans and humans, once near allies, now found themselves at an impasse. Their fleet stood face to face at the Veritan border, a battle line drawn in the stars. The final words in the council were from Ambassador Varro, his voice echoing in the chamber, we have made our stand. We will not be moved. The council chamber fell silent. A sense of dread permeated through the air. A full-blown galactic war loomed ominously, threatening to erupt and engulf the stars. This was no longer a mere dispute. The Veritans and humans, on the brink of war, were about to draw the entire galaxy into the fray. The Outbreak of War In the days following the Veritan attack on the Vanguard, the Galactic Council Chamber buzzed with an intensity that hadn't been witnessed for generations. Ambassador Solane's holographic image was projected from the Resurgence, the flagship of the human fleet. Solane's face was a rigid mask of restraint, his ice-blue eyes glistening with a mixture of regret and determination. Across the chamber, Ambassador Varro of Veritas was an opposing image of fiery defiance. Solane spoke first, his voice echoing around the silent chamber. In the light of continued Veritan aggression, despite numerous attempts at a peaceful resolution, the Human Federation has no choice but to respond in kind. The humans, for the first time in our history, declare war. His words hung heavy in the chamber, a bleak echo marking the end of an era of peace. Varro, ever the orator, replied with thunderous fury. You push us into a corner, and then declare us the aggressors? We stand our ground, as we always have. You shall see, Solane, that the Veritans do not yield easily. The tension in the Galactic Council Chamber escalated to palpable levels. Diplomats and representatives from countless species whispered amongst themselves. War was coming. An inescapable, catastrophic war. But, for the moment, an eerie silence filled the universe as if it held its breath, waiting for the inevitable explosion. In the vast void of space, starships stood on the precipice of violence. The Veritan and human fleets, each a formidable assembly of technological prowess and military might, faced each other. The chilling silence was punctuated only by the frantic communication signals flying between the ships. Orders were given. Weapons were primed. Captain Jane Langford of the SS Destiny received the order and related to her crew. Engage combat protocol. Initiate first strike. Fire at will. Back on New Terra, the declaration of war was met with a sobering mix of fear, resolve, and a rallying call to protect their world. Massive screens in city squares played the declaration on a loop. 
The atmosphere was tense, but there was a sense of unity as well. In houses, offices, and schools, people stopped their day-to-day -day activities, their attention captured by the gravitas of the moment. On Veritas, the reaction was similar, but tinged with a greater sense of outrage. The human declaration of war was seen as a blatant act of aggression against their sovereignty. The Veritans, a warrior race proud of their martial traditions, prepared for war with a grim determination. The sparks of war ignited, casting long and foreboding shadows across the galaxies. The echoes of peace were swiftly drowned out by the clamoring drums of war, their beats resonating across the cosmos. And as the fleets of humans and Veritans took their positions among the stars, the universe shuddered on the brink of a devastating conflict. First Contact As the first streams of light from the human proton weapons lit up the void of space, the waiting game ended. The human fleet, led by the SS Destiny, swarmed into action, their smaller, faster ships slicing through the void with a precision and agility that caught the Veritans off guard. Veritan ships, grandiose in their architectural beauty, luminescent against the backdrop of space, held their positions. They were larger, more intimidating, but they lacked the nimbleness of their human counterparts. Their response was a flurry of energy blasts, designed to overpower rather than outmaneuver. Captain Langford, her fingers dancing across the hollow controls, orchestrated a symphony of evasion and retaliation. Launch proton salvo on my mark, she commanded. Divert power to front shields. Navigation, keep us mobile. Across the human fleet, similar commands were issued. Each ship, acting both independently and as a collective, played its part. The human proton weapons, already proven in earlier confrontations, tore through the Veritan energy shields. A chillingly beautiful display of light and destruction unfolded as the energy blasts met the shields, bursts of light illuminating the void. On the Veritan flagship, the tone was markedly different. Our shields are failing, came the alarmed report. The Veritan command struggled to respond to the swift and deadly human assault. But despite their superior numbers, they were being outmaneuvered and overpowered. Back on New Terra, people gathered in the public squares and around screens in their homes, watching as the first reports of the initial battles came in. The sense of unity was even stronger now, but the reality of war was beginning to hit home. The faces of the brave men and women serving on the ships in those distant battles were displayed, their smiling photos a stark contrast to the reports of the battle. A similar scenario was playing out on Veritas. The Veritans, who had believed in their inherent superiority, found the initial reports hard to accept. They had not expected the humans to be so formidable. Their warrior spirit, however, did not falter. They resolved to fight on. Back in space, the first major conflict of the war raged on. The SS Destiny, leading the attack, aimed their next salvo at the Veritan flagship. The blast from the proton weapon pierced the Veritan ship's shields, tearing a gaping hole in its side. It was a critical hit. The ship listed heavily to one side, its lights flickering and dying. The rest of the Veritan fleet watched in stunned silence as their flagship faltered. The humans, they realized, were not only matching them but besting them. Their energy shields were failing against the human proton weapons, their slower, bulkier ships unable to evade the swift human vessels. As the debris from the Veritan flagship drifted through space, the grim reality of the situation dawned on the Veritan fleet. The battle was far from over, but the opening act had been decisively won by the humans. But even as the human fleet celebrated their first victory, they were all too aware that the war had only just begun. The Veritans, caught off guard, would regroup and retaliate. The drums of war had only just started to beat, and the echoes of their rhythm promised a long and bloody conflict ahead. The first day of war ended, not with a sense of victory, but a sobering understanding of the long road ahead. The taste of victory and bitter defeat. The Veritans regrouped, their once imposing fleet disarrayed by the force of the human attack. They huddled in their meeting chambers, faces grim, eyes filled with the chilling reality of their defeat. Their belief in their invincibility had been shaken, but not shattered. They resolved to fight back. Back aboard the SS Destiny, Captain Langford stared out at the flickering lights of the damaged Veritan flagship. Her heart swelled with a mix of pride and apprehension. They had won the first round, but this was just the beginning. Set a course for the rendezvous point. We need to regroup and prepare for the next phase, Langford ordered. The ship hummed in response, shifting course, and slipped into the nebulous haze of a nearby gas giant's ring system. It was a strategic move, providing them with a natural defensive barrier while they regrouped and planned their next attack. On the Galactic Council stage, Ambassador Varov stood, his face grim. 
the news of the first conflict had reached them and the Veritans had suffered. We underestimated the humans, he admitted, his voice heavy with regret. Our failure today should not be seen as the measure of our strength. We will fight back and we will reclaim our dignity. Across the galaxy, on the podium in the center of New Terrace Council, Ambassador Solane echoed his sentiments. Today, we have shown that we are not to be trifled with, he proclaimed, his voice resounding through the hall. But this is only the first battle in a war that may stretch on. We must stay united, stay strong, and we will prevail. The second day of war dawned with a new resolve. The Veritans launched a counterattack, their energy weapons blazing. The human fleet was ready. Their ships, already battle-hardened from the first day, responded with coordinated maneuvers that kept them one step ahead of the Veritan onslaught. The Veritans aimed for a quick victory, hoping to regain their lost ground, but the humans were relentless. A back-and-forth battle ensued, both sides pushing and pulling, a dance of destruction playing out on the grand canvas of space. Ships exploded in showers of debris, energy blasts lighting up the void, and in the midst of it all, the SS Destiny fought like a vanguard, leading the human fleet to victory. By the time the skirmish ended, the humans had again emerged victorious, their superior tactics and weapons proving to be the key. The Veritans retreated, their morale shattered, their fleet dwindling. On Veritas, news of the second defeat hit hard. The Veritans, a proud warrior race, found the losses hard to stomach. There was fear, doubt, and a sense of foreboding. Their leaders struggled to maintain control, to rally their people, to uphold the belief in their strength and superiority. Back on New Terra, the victories were celebrated. But with every report of a ship lost, of lives sacrificed, the reality of war sunk in. Their faces lit up with pride, but their hearts heavy with the cost of such victories. In space, on the bridge of the SS Destiny, Captain Langford looked out at the stars. They had proven their mettle, proven they could not only withstand the Veritans, but best them. But the war was far from over. It was only the beginning. The taste of victory was bitter, tainted with the cost of lives lost. As the lights of distant stars flickered in the vastness of space, the galaxy held its breath. The war was just beginning, the stakes higher than ever before. The humans, though victorious, were not naive. They knew the Veritans would strike back, and they would be ready. The galactic tides of war. The Veritans had been a force of stability and control for centuries, but their defeat at the hands of the humans had shattered this image. With each passing day, the fear of the humans' might and resolve spread throughout the galaxy. The Galactic Council found itself in a tumultuous position, attempting to maintain neutrality in the face of a war that threatened to engulf the whole galaxy. In the Council Chambers, Ambassador Solane took center stage. We fight not for control or dominance, but for our right to exist without oppression, he declared, his gaze scanning the room. A murmur of whispers followed, conversations oscillating between unease and respect. Meanwhile, within the Veritan Command Center, a strategic counterstrike was being planned. The loss of their once indomitable fleet had been a hard pill to swallow. It was a critical blow to their pride and had resulted in a significant loss of their strategic assets. But the Veritans were not a race to back down. The humans are strong, but they are not invincible, proclaimed General Vras, pounding his fist on the command table. Our next strike must be decisive and absolute. We need to utilize our superior numbers and raw power, surprise them with a blitz attack. His eyes sparkled with the fire of determination. The Veritans rallied around his rallying call, their spirits rekindled, their resolve hardened. Back aboard the SS Destiny, the celebration of their victories was short-lived. They had emerged victorious from the initial clashes, but the cost had been high. They knew the Veritans were still a formidable enemy and wouldn't be defeated so easily. Preparing for the onslaught they knew would come, Captain Langford instructed her crew to maintain high alert. Our enemy is wounded, and that makes them more dangerous. We cannot let our guard down, she said, her gaze hard and unwavering. The humans knew they were in uncharted territory, their small fleet against the might of the Veritans. But their resolve had been tempered in the fires of battle, and they would not back down. As the stage was set for the next round of confrontations, news of the war had spread throughout the galaxy. Races watched with bated breath, and alliances shifted. Some minor races, long oppressed under the Veritans, even reached out to the humans, offering aid and resources. Back on the Galactic Council, tensions were high. The council members were aware that their next decisions could shape the fate of the galaxy. Ambassador Solane urged them to consider the consequences of a prolonged war and the potential destruction it could bring. 
Simultaneously, on Veritas, a planet gripped by fear and uncertainty, General Vras rallied his forces, preparing them for the battle ahead. Despite the two defeats, the Veritans remained determined. As the fourth day of the war dawned, the SS Destiny stood at the forefront of the human fleet, ready to face whatever the Veritans threw at them. Back on New Terra, people watched and waited, their hearts filled with both pride and apprehension. The Veritan forces surged forward, their energy weapons blazing, marking the beginning of another day of battle. The humans met them head-on, their proton weapons causing devastating damage to the enemy's lines. A day of fierce battles ensued, but the humans, against all odds, managed to push the Veritans back once again. As the final reports of the day trickled in, it was clear that the humans had gained the upper hand. The Veritan attacks had been thwarted, their fleet further diminished. The news rippled through the galaxy, instilling a mix of awe and fear. The tide of war had turned in favor of the humans, but the conflict was far from over. The galaxy braced itself for the battles yet to come. The Call for Negotiations Ambassador Solane had called for an immediate cessation of hostilities, an olive branch extended in the midst of a storm. Their message had been clear, unmistakable in its gravity. Stop the war. Cease the futile and needless bloodshed. All of this, however, would hinge on the willingness of the Veritans to accept this gesture of peace. We offer this not out of fear or desperation. Selene had spoken on the broadcast that now spanned across the vast stretches of the galaxy, reaching the corners of Veritan space and the chambers of the Galactic Council, but out of hope. Hope that we can bring an end to this cycle of violence and loss. On New Terra, the message was received with a mix of apprehension and relief. The populace was war-weary, the conflicts having taken their toll on their psyches. The prospect of peace was a beacon of hope amidst the tension and despair that had gripped their society. Within the chambers of the Galactic Council, Solane's message echoed in the vast assembly hall. Various species, each representing their world, listened in silence as the human ambassador made his plea. It was a plea that challenged the very ethos of the Veritans and their belief in their inherent superiority. Ambassador Vero of the Veritans stood in stony silence, the weight of the decision looming over him. His pride wrestled with the realities of their situation, the glaring truth that the Veritans, despite their grandeur and power, were not faring well against the humans. The divisions within the Veritan leadership were stark, the hawks within the council pushing for a continued show of force, while the doves called for a reconsideration of their stance. Back on the Veritan homeworld, news of Solane's call for peace had reached their citizens, stirring a flurry of reactions. Some clamored for a continued fight, driven by their deeply rooted pride and belief in their invincibility. Others, however, began to question the path their leaders had chosen. They were tired, their lives upended by a war that seemed increasingly unwinnable. As the Veritans grappled with this existential crossroads, Solane, in the heart of human space, braced himself for the challenges that lay ahead. They had thrown their hat into the ring. It was now up to the Veritans to decide whether to take up the call for peace or descend further into the abyss of war. The Veritans' Last Stand the Veritans, in a desperate attempt to turn the tide, had chosen to stage a bold and audacious offensive against New Terra, the cradle of human civilization. Their last remaining fleet of five gargantuan battleships, eclipsing the grandeur of any human ship, suddenly dropped out of warp space near the human homeworld. The Veritans made no attempt at subtlety. Their appearance was a bold declaration of war. Their leader, the fearsome General Kelzar transmitted a broadcast to the entire human population. His voice echoed through every city, every town, every home on New Terra. Humans, he boomed, your reign ends today. Surrender now and we may spare your cities. Defy us and we will erase your existence from the stars. There was no mistaking the threat. The Veritan battleships, their hulls gleaming with deadly intent, loomed over New Terra like dark specters. The populace watched in awe and terror as the colossal enemy ships took positions, their weapon systems charging ominously. Meanwhile, in the Galactic Council chambers, Ambassador Varro, now grim and resolute, watched the unfolding events with a sinking heart. He had tried to advocate for peace, to halt the rush into the abyss, but he had been overruled by the military council. 
Now, as he saw the mighty Veriton fleet threatening the human homeworld, he feared that the point of no return had been reached. On Nutera, however, the humans had not been idle. They had anticipated the possibility of such a desperate move from the Veritans and had prepared accordingly. As the Veritan demands boomed across the planet, a single voice responded, calm yet resolute. It was Ambassador Solane. General Kelzar, he addressed the Veritan leader, your threats are heard, but they will not sway us. We will not surrender, not out of stubborn pride, but because we have learned painfully what it means to be free. We are willing to negotiate, but we will not be coerced. As his words resonated through the telescreens, Solane gave a silent command. Suddenly, an intricate network of planetary defense systems sprung to life. Shields, unseen before, began to shimmer around the cities, and massive ground-to-space cannons pivoted towards the looming Veriton ships. In the Galactic Council, Solane's response was met with a stunned silence. For the first time in the history of the Council, a species was not only defying the Veritans, but they were also ready to defend themselves against their full might. Meanwhile, on the Veritan battleships, the command crew exchanged anxious glances. The human response was not what they had expected. It was a stalemate. But in their hearts, the Veritans knew they had overplayed their hand. Now, the ball was in the human's court, and the entire galaxy watched with bated breath. The Battle of Nutera. As Ambassador Solane's words rang out across Nutera, General Kelzar's countenance hardened. The moment had arrived. Very well, humans, he responded, his voice carrying an edge of desperation. You have sealed your fate. With those words, the Veriton fleet opened fire. Thousands of plasma blasts and missiles streaked across the inky blackness of space towards Nutera. Across the planet, People watched with bated breath as the deadly onslaught hurtled towards their homes. The human defense systems hummed into action. From the ground, a web of brilliant blue light emerged, rising to envelop the planet in an enormous shield. The incoming Veriton fire crashed against it, resulting in a spectacle of sparks and flares. New Terra stood, untouched beneath its protective barrier. Then came the second wave of human defense. Ground-to-space cannons returned fire, launching a barrage of proton beams towards the Veriton fleet. Each beam cut through space, swift and deadly. The Veriton shields, the most advanced in the known galaxy, flickered under the onslaught, struggling to hold off the human retaliation. On the Galactic Council, an uneasy silence fell over the room as the counselors watched the battle unfold. Veriton Ambassador Varro stood there, his face pale as he watched the assault on New Terra. The humans, it seemed, were not just surviving the Veriton onslaught, they were retaliating. Their defenses, their technology, and their resolve were far beyond anything the galaxy had ever witnessed. They had grown, evolved, and were no longer the fledgling race that had been exiled centuries ago. Back at Nutera, the battle was nearing its climax. The relentless bombardment from both sides was taking its toll. Despite the Veritans' advanced technology, their ships were beginning to falter under the weight of the human counterattack. The shields flickered, then wavered, and finally gave way. The once mighty Veritan fleet was laid bare to the ferocity of the human counterstrike. The decisive blow came from the capital city, Concordia. The city's massive central cannon, its most powerful weapon, unleashed a torrent of energy. The proton beam shot across the distance, connecting with the leading Veriton battleship. It cut through the hull like a hot knife through butter, splitting the colossal ship into two. The ship's power core destabilized, resulting in a massive explosion that sent shockwaves across space, further damaging the surrounding Veriton ships. The tide of the battle had turned. The Veritans, having lost their flagship and with their remaining vessels critically damaged, had no choice but to retreat. As their ships limped away from Nutera, it was clear that the humans had won this battle, and perhaps the war. Their display of resistance, technology, and sheer resolve had not only defended their homeworld, but had also sent a clear message across the galaxy. Humans were a force to be reckoned with. The age of Veritan dominance was over. The entire galaxy watched in stunned silence as the Veritans retreated. They had witnessed the rise of a new power and the fall of an old one. They had seen the underdogs stand up and not just fight, but win against a seemingly invincible foe. The Battle of New Terra was over. 
The humans had defended their homeworld and had shown their mettle to the galaxy. The message was loud and clear. Humans would not be bullied or threatened. They were here to stay, and they were not to be underestimated. The Unconditional Surrender with the Veritan forces routed and their pride crushed, the once indomitable race had to face the inevitable. Their grand fleet, once the galaxy's most formidable, was now reduced to a scattered collection of battered warships. The silence of defeat echoed through the ranks of the Veritan Empire. Back at the Galactic Council, the atmosphere was tense. The counselors, having just witnessed the astounding military prowess of the humans, were coming to grips with a profound shift in the galactic balance of power. Ambassador Solane stood tall and resolute, his face a mask of grim determination. Today, he began, his voice echoing through the hall, we have shown you the metal of humanity. We have shown you that we are not the fragile race you once thought us to be. We were hunted, driven from our homes, and almost eradicated. We found a new home, we rebuilt, we regrouped, we grew, and we developed. And we have come back to reclaim what is ours. We will not be threatened, we will not be bullied, and we will certainly not be eradicated. His gaze then shifted to Ambassador Varro, who, despite his race's recent defeat, stood tall, maintaining a stoic front. Ambassador Varro! Selene continued, his tone growing softer. We do not wish for more destruction, more loss. But know this, we are ready to fight until the last man if we must. With a sigh, Selene paused and looked around the council chamber. But it does not have to be this way. You have seen our power. You have seen the result of relentless pursuit. This war benefits no one. We urge you to reconsider. The choice is yours, Varro. Varro, who had been silent all this while, finally spoke. Ambassador Solane, you leave us no choice. We have witnessed your power, and we have felt the sting of your wrath. It is clear to us now that we underestimated you. He paused, taking a deep breath. In the light of these recent events, on behalf of the Veritan Empire, I, Ambassador Varro, offer our unconditional surrender. Gasps filled the council chamber. The Veritan Empire, known for its fierce warriors and advanced technology, had never before bowed down to any race. Yet, here they were, admitting defeat to the humans, a race they had once deemed weak and insignificant. Ambassador Solane merely nodded, accepting the surrender with grace and dignity. Let this be a lesson to us all, he concluded, his voice filled with solemn resolve. The pursuit of power without respect for others only leads to one's downfall. It's time for us to move forward, to create a galaxy where each race is respected and valued. Let's not make the same mistakes again. With those words, the chapter of a brutal war came to an end. The humans had not only defended their homeland, but also re-established themselves as a powerful entity in the galaxy. But perhaps more importantly, they had set a precedent for the rest of the galaxy, showing that respect and diplomacy could lead to strength and unity. As the Galactic Council erupted into a storm of conversation and debates about the future, one thing was clear. The galaxy had forever changed. A new era had begun, one where humans had carved their rightful place among the stars, ushering in a new age of balance and respect among the interstellar community. The reign of the Veritan Empire had ended, and a new chapter had begun for all races in the galaxy. A chapter where humans were not merely survivors, but influencers of peace, power, and progress. Continuing his speech, Solane declared, A treaty will be drafted that will lay down the terms of the Veritans' capitulation and the course of our future diplomatic relationships. We advocate for coexistence and mutual respect among all species in this council. His gaze swept over the room, resting momentarily on Varro. And we insist this includes the rights of humans as well. His words painted the dawn of a new epic not only for humanity, but for the entire galaxy. Drafting of the Treaty In the aftermath of the war, the Galactic Council's Grand Chamber bore witness to a moment of profound change. Beneath its glistening dome, a historic process was unfolding. Humanity's Ambassador Solane and Veritan's Ambassador Varro were seated across the negotiation table, drafting the terms of peace. Let's keep this simple, Solane started, his stern gaze locked onto Varro. We need peace, and we need assurance that such hostilities will not be repeated. 
Varro nodded in agreement, the defeat still fresh on his face. We agree. The Veritan Empire has no intention of waging war again. The first point of the treaty stipulated an immediate cessation of all hostilities. This was followed by terms for disarmament and decommissioning of the Veritan military facilities. Each term was discussed, scrutinized, and debated in painstaking detail, ensuring a comprehensive and effective treaty. Let us not forget the importance of mutual respect, Selene insisted, bringing forth a key point. We insist that human rights be enshrined in the Galactic Council's constitution. Humans shall not be regarded as lesser beings, neither by Veritans nor any other species in this council. Varro, despite his race's recent defeat, acknowledged this demand. Respect begets peace. We are ready to make this commitment, he agreed. Negotiations continued for days, with delegates working tirelessly. Talks were interspersed with moments of heated discussions and tranquil consensus, all under the watchful eyes of the galactic community. We also propose a policy of integration between humans and Veritans, Selene proposed one day. A murmur ran through the chamber. We believe it would create a deeper understanding between our species and foster lasting peace. Varro looked thoughtful at this proposition, his eyes betraying his inner contemplation. After a moment of silence, he nodded. This proposal has merit. We will consider it in our discussions. As the sessions wore on, Selene and Varro, once bitter adversaries, were now crafting a shared path to peace. Despite their contrasting backgrounds, they found common ground in their mutual desire for harmony. Their discussions, punctuated with diplomatic tact and mutual respect, were slowly forming the bedrock of a new era. Meanwhile, back on New Terra, news of the negotiations spread, stirring a mix of hope and skepticism among the populace. Similarly, across the galaxies in Veritan territories, there was an air of cautious optimism. Citizens, soldiers, and politicians alike held their breath, anticipating the future of their interstellar relations. In the end, the Treaty of New Terra, as it came to be known, was a masterstroke of diplomacy and a testament to the collective will for peace. It encapsulated the sacrifices made, lessons learned, and the path forward for two races that had been at war not long ago. The drafted treaty was comprehensive, addressing issues from disarmament to mutual respect, from reparations to integration. It was a symbol of hope for many, a realization to the possibility of reconciliation and cohabitation after such a devastating conflict. The final day of negotiation saw Selene and Varro rise from their seats, treaty in hand. As they stood before the galactic community, they weren't just representatives of their respective races anymore. They were harbingers of a new dawn, an era of cooperation, respect, and unity. This marks the end of a dark chapter, Selene addressed the council, holding up the treaty, and the beginning of a brighter one. And let it be known, Varro added, that from this moment onwards, humans and Veritans will stand together, not as enemies, but as allies for a peaceful galaxy. The applause that filled the chamber resonated far beyond the council's walls, echoing through the vast expanse of space, a testament to the resilient spirit of peace and the promise of a unified future. And with that, a new chapter in galactic history began to unfold. Disarmament and integration. With the treaty's signatures still fresh, the arduous task of its implementation began. The first step was the disarming of the Veritan military complex, a process that would symbolize their commitment to peace and their capitulation to the terms of the treaty. At the break of dawn, the decommissioning process began. Human and Veritan soldiers, once engaged in fierce battles against each other, were now working side by side. The sight of Veritan warships being methodically disarmed under the watchful gaze of human forces was an impactful image symbolizing the scale of change that the galaxy was witnessing. Meanwhile, Varro returned to his home planet, where he delivered a heartfelt address to his people. He spoke of the lessons learned from the war, their new commitment to peace, and their plans for the future. His words were met with a mix of resignation, acceptance, and hope for what lay ahead. Parallel to this, a new policy was being set in motion on New Terra, a policy of integration. For the first time in their history, human and Veritan citizens were encouraged to work together, learn from each other, and foster a sense of mutual understanding. 
The initial days were awkward and tense. Centuries of mistrust and recent memories of war didn't just vanish overnight. However, the shared task of rebuilding and the common goal of peace gradually softened the hardened stances. In the bustling shipyards of Nutera, human and Veritan engineers collaborated on the designs of new starships. In research labs, scientists of both species shared knowledge and worked on innovative technologies. Veritan soldiers began to serve under human captains, offering their expertise and slowly adapting to their new roles. Back on Verita, a similar scene was unfolding. Human delegates arrived to assist in the restructuring of Veritan civil institutions, while human workers aided in the rebuilding of cities devastated by the war. In this atmosphere of cooperation and shared purpose, the seeds of integration were sown. News of these efforts spread across the galaxy, earning both praise and skepticism. Many lauded the brave and necessary steps taken by the humans and Veritans, while others questioned whether such a deep-seated animosity could truly be overcome. Yet in the face of doubt and criticism, the leaders remained steadfast. Solane continued to champion the cause of peace and integration at the Galactic Council, often quoting, Peace isn't just about avoiding conflict, it's about facing it, understanding it, and then moving past it together. Meanwhile, in the starlit skies above New Terra and Verita, joint human Veritan patrol ships started their rotations. Watching them glide across the sky, one couldn't help but marvel at how much had changed, and how much more could still change. As the sun set on the planets, casting long shadows and painting the sky with hues of orange and purple, it marked the end of an eventful day. It was just one day in a series of many, each one bringing the galaxy closer to a future that, not so long ago, seemed an impossibility. These days were not without their challenges. Prejudices were not easily forgotten, and old wounds still stung. But for every setback, there were stories of progress. Stories of a Veritan helping a human child fix a hoverbike. Of a human saving a Veritan from a collapsing scaffold. Of shared meals and laughter that bridged the gap between two civilizations. And so, the days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months. The process was slow, but the changes were tangible. From the shipyards of New Terra to the gleaming cities of Verita, an unprecedented era of cooperation was gradually taking shape. It was as if the entire galaxy held its breath, watching a grand experiment unfold, an experiment in unity, understanding, and shared destiny. Trials and the Disappearance as the intricate dance of peace and cooperation continued, the moment arrived to address a darker side of the war, the trials of those Veritans responsible for the atrocities committed against humanity. The Galactic Council, led by Solane, set up a special tribunal. The panel comprised representatives from multiple races, ensuring a fair and unbiased judgment. Chief among the defendants was the Veritan military leader, General Zorvan a hawkish figure known for his aggressive strategies and dismissive views of the human race. However, just before the trial could commence, news spread of Zorvan's disappearance. It was discovered that the general and five Veritan cruisers, manned by his loyal crew, had vanished. The Veritan council was baffled. Zorvan and his allies had evidently refused to accept the peace treaty and had fled. Their destination was unknown, and their motives could only be guessed at. The prospect of future conflicts with this rogue faction was deeply unsettling. In Zorvan's absence, the tribunal decided to try him in absentia. The damning evidence against Zorvan left no doubt about his guilt. The tribunal handed down its judgment. Zorvan was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. Should he ever be captured, the sentence was to be carried out on a remote prison colony. The sentence was a clear message to the galaxy. No individual, regardless of their status or whereabouts, could escape justice for their actions. The trial concluded, but its ripples would be felt across the galaxy for a long time. It was a cathartic moment for humanity, a symbol of closure, and a step towards healing the deep-seated wounds of the past. Meanwhile, the integration efforts on New Terra and Verita experienced growing pains. Some Veritan soldiers, likely influenced by Zorvan's rebellion, bristled under human command, causing tensions in the joint defense fleet. On the other hand, some human workers on Verita complained about the challenging conditions and perceived slights. Solane and Varro worked tirelessly to address these issues. 
They held town hall meetings, encouraged open communication, and instituted strict non-discrimination policies. They knew that for integration to succeed, they had to ensure equal respect and dignity for everyone involved. Amidst these developments, economic reforms were put in place. As Vero had warned, the Veritin economy was in shambles thanks to the war. Solane proposed a plan for a shared economic zone between humans and Veritins, which would allow for free trade and joint ventures, boosting both economies and fostering mutual dependence. As the joint economic plan was put into action, the fruits of human Veritin cooperation began to bloom. The mighty manufacturing infrastructure of Verita coupled with human ingenuity led to a range of innovative products. Advanced spacecraft engines were born, along with an array of versatile terraforming tools, testament to the potential of this burgeoning alliance. However, just as progress seemed to be flowing smoothly, an unsettling report reached Solane's desk. A distant star located in the farthest reaches of the galaxy had inexplicably gone dark. This inexplicable phenomenon, naturally unexplainable, caused a ripple of concern to spread through the Galactic Council. The Council convened, the air filled with apprehension. After a thorough discussion, they agreed to investigate this cosmic mystery. Solane and Varro suggested a joint human Veritan mission, the first of its kind since the peace treaty, to probe into this enigma. However, this plan was put on hold. Another issue was brewing that demanded immediate attention. General Zorvan, the fugitive Veritan general, was still at large. His capture had become the topmost priority, casting a looming shadow over the galactic peace. Every ship, human or Veritan, was alerted and ordered to report any suspicious activity. Zorvan was a thorn in the side of their newly formed alliance, a persistent reminder of past divisions and conflicts. In response to this urgent situation, a special task force was assembled. Comprised of both human and Veritan military elites, this unit was tasked with the daunting mission of hunting down Zorvan. Every member of this squadron knew the stakes. Zorvan's capture was not only a matter of justice, but also a critical step in solidifying the hard-earned peace. The unsettling cosmic mystery of the disappearing star would have to wait, as the focus turned to the immediate threat posed by Zorvan. As they moved forward, Solane, Varro, and the rest of the Galactic Council remained steadfast in their commitment to peace and prosperity. The hunt for Zorvan was on, and they were determined to capture the fugitive general and prove that no force could destabilize the unity they had achieved. In the sprawling cosmos, Veritan General Zorvan had been a stalwart of the battlefield for over a century. His indomitable spirit, his unfaltering leadership, and his tactical prowess had carved his name in the annals of Veritan military history. Yet the tide of time brought changes even the age-hardened general couldn't ignore. The advent of the human Veritan treaty struck Zorvan like a cosmic shockwave, shaking the very core of his centuries-old beliefs. It was not the concept of peace he found distasteful, but the insidious servitude it masked. The notion of Veritans, the race that had led countless fleets and won countless battles, bending the knee to the young and inexperienced human race was a bitter pill to swallow. It was a disgrace that Zorvan, a symbol of Veritan pride and might, would not accept. The machinations of the Galactic Council for war crimes trials against him added fuel to his smoldering resentment. It was an absurd claim, a political maneuver by the humans to discredit and dismantle Veritan superiority. The sense of betrayal stung sharper than the harshest nebula storm. Betrayed by the very council he had served loyally, sidelined by the growing human influence, Zorvan felt the foundations of his universe shaking. His decision came quickly. His pride would not allow him to stand idly by while his people were led into subservience nor would he bow his head to the hollow justice of the Galactic Council. The corridors of his flagship hummed with defiance as he orchestrated his escape. Commandeering five Veritan cruisers, Zorvan and his loyal comrades plotted their course, making a bold statement to the Council. Their departure echoed through the cosmos, a declaration of rebellion against the New World Order. Unchartered territories awaited Zorvan and his fleet. A new chapter in the Veritan legacy was about to be written, not in the grand council halls, but in the cold, unyielding depths of space.
The narrative of peace spun by the humans was about to be challenged by a warrior who refused to relinquish his race's superiority. As Zorvan's ships disappeared into the cosmic void, a singular thought resonated through his mind. The Veritans had been first. They had been leaders. It was a position they deserved, a position they would reclaim. His rebellion was not just about evading a trial. It was about reasserting Veritan dominance, about making sure the galaxy knew. The Veritans were not yet done. The game was far from over, and Zorvan was ready to play. Within the confines of his flagship, Zorvan was not alone. He was accompanied by four other commanders, each a leader of a Veritan cruiser that had chosen to join him in his rebellion. They were the guardians of Veritan pride, comrades who had shared countless battlefields with Zorvan over the last century. They had seen the highs and lows of the Veritan legacy, had fought alongside Zorvan, had been inspired by him, and now stood by him in this dire moment. Commanders Vor, Cestus, Everen, and Ishtara each commanded respect in the Veritan ranks. They had carved their names in the annals of Veritan military history, their experiences enriched by their shared past with Zorvan. Their faith in the veteran general was unshaken, their loyalty unwavering. Word had reached them about the Orinthians leaving the Galactic Council. It was surprising news, but it gave the Veritans a glimmer of hope. The Orinthians were not fans of the humans either, their departure a clear indication of their dissatisfaction with the Council's decisions. When Zorvan proposed the idea of an alliance with the Orinthians, the four commanders were unanimous in their agreement. The Orinthians were a powerful race, their military prowess unquestionable. An alliance with them would bolster the Veritan rebellion, providing them with the support they needed. The Orinthians, for their part, welcomed the idea. They had watched the rise of the humans with disdain, their departure from the council a clear statement of their dissatisfaction. Zorvan offered an alternative, a chance to regain their dignity. In Zorvan, they saw a leader who was not afraid to stand against the tide, who dared to challenge the New World Order. With a shared vision of a galaxy free from human influence, the Orinthians offered Zorvan and his rebels a safe haven. They were granted an old military base on the fringes of the Orinthian territory, a place where they could regroup, plan their next steps. As the Veritan cruisers landed on the Orinthian base, it was clear that this rebellion was more than just a fight against a council decision. It was a fight for their identity, for their place in the cosmos. If you like this story, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for the next part. Now, in their newfound sanctuary, Zorvan and his commanders began to strategize. The next phase of their rebellion was about to begin. A rebellion not just about evading a trial, but about reclaiming the Veritan legacy. Zorvan, with his loyal commanders and newfound allies, was ready for the fight. The game was far from over, and the Veritans were just getting started. Zorvan and his loyal commanders were fugitives, but they were not aimless. With the Orinthians as allies, they had found a temporary sanctuary. But they needed more than that. They needed a base of operations, a stronghold from where they could launch their counteroffensive against the Galactic Council. As they deliberated their next steps, Zorvan set his sight on an uncharted star system. It was an area shrouded in cosmic dust and an asteroid belt, ideal for shielding from prying eyes. At the heart of the system was a blue star, around which orbited several planets ripe with resources. It was the perfect location for a new Veritan stronghold. The Orinthians were key in this endeavor. They provided supply lines for the Veritans, ensuring that they had all the necessary tools for survival. Encrypted communications were set up, allowing Zorvan and his crew to remain updated about the happenings in the Council and the rest of the galaxy. The move to the new base was made with utmost secrecy. The Veritan cruisers, loaded with their crews and resources, maneuvered their way through the asteroid belt. As the stronghold took form, a sense of hope began to permeate the Veritans. They had found a new home, a fortress from where they could revive the Veritan legacy. Meanwhile, Zorvan's gaze remained fixed on the human Veritan borders. If they were to send a message to the humans, they needed to strike where it would hurt most. The humans had always boasted about their diplomatic victories, their supposed integration with the Veritans. Zorvan decided that it was time to expose the fragility of their alliance. 
Striking at the heart of the human borders, Zorvin made his first move. His forces appeared out of nowhere, their surprise attacks leaving the humans scrambling. They would proclaim their presence, their intent to continue the eradication of the humans, and then strike at their vessels. These attacks were not about causing widespread destruction, but about sending a clear message. The Veritans were not to be taken lightly. The human Veritan border became the new front line, a testament to the rebellion that Zorvan had ignited. Each attack was a show of strength, a display of the Veritan military prowess that had for so long been suppressed. It was a reminder to the humans and the council that the Veritan rebellion was alive and kicking. Zorvan, from his new base, was leading the charge, and he was just getting started. As Zorvan and his Veritan rebellion began to shake the foundations of the Galactic Council, the news of the new alliance reached the far corners of the cosmos. The seeds of distrust, carefully sowed by Zorvan and his companions, began to germinate. A sense of uncertainty loomed over the council as they watched one of their oldest members drift away. The Orinthians, a key race in the Galactic Council, had always been wary of the humans. The council's decision to broker a peace deal with the humans and integrate them into the council had not sat well with the Orinthians. They viewed the humans as a threat to the old order. They were concerned that the humans, given their rapid growth and thirst for power, would soon start to overshadow the other races. The alliance with Zorvan presented an alternative for the Orinthians. Zorvan offered them an opportunity to maintain their position in the galactic pecking order. In a council dominated by humans, Zorvan's vision of a Veritan-led order was appealing to the Orinthians. They saw in Zorvan a leader who was willing to take bold steps to ensure that the balance of power did not tilt in favor of the humans. The Orinthians' decision to leave the council shocked the galactic community. Their exit, coupled with the rising power of Zorvan's rebellion, marked a significant shift in the political landscape of the galaxy. There were whispers of a new order, one that would challenge the influence of the galactic council. The Veritans, under Zorvan's leadership, were growing stronger. Their hit-and-run attacks on the human Veritan borders were growing bolder and more frequent. They were not just rebels anymore, they were a formidable force that the Council could no longer ignore. Zorvan's vision of a new order was not just about restoring Veritan supremacy, it was about creating a balance of power where no single race could dominate the others. He believed in a galaxy where the strong lead, but do not overpower the weak a galaxy where the Veritans could thrive without having to compromise their principles. His rebellion was more than a military movement. It was a call for change, a challenge to the status quo. It was a symbol of resistance against the Galactic Council's passive acceptance of human dominance. The Orinthians, by aligning themselves with Zorvan, had shown their support for his vision. It was a significant victory for Zorvan, a step towards realizing his vision, it was also a warning to the Galactic Council that their rule was not absolute. As Zorvan's rebellion gained momentum, one thing became clear. The galaxy was on the cusp of a new era. The future was uncertain, and only time would tell whether Zorvan's vision would prevail, or whether the Council would find a way to quell the rising tide of rebellion. For now, the General, from his hideout in the cosmos, continued to plot his next move, watching as his vision for a new order began to take shape. Zorvan's rebellion was just the beginning, and the galaxy braced itself for the storm that was brewing in the far reaches of space. The Hunt for Zorvan Life aboard the flagship of the joint human Veritan fleet had a certain rhythm to it. The ship, proof of the unprecedented alliance, was a hub of constant activity. Veritans, known for their imposing stature and hardened exoskeletons, moved effortlessly through the vessel's corridors. Their steps, heavier than those of the humans, echoed throughout the ship. At first, the notion of an alliance between humans and Veritans was greeted with skepticism by many. The Veritans, a race who had seen and fought in countless wars, joining forces with the humans, a fledgling race with far less military prowess was hard to fathom. But the past few months had brought significant changes. The integration was proceeding, albeit with a few hiccups. It was a fascinating symbiosis of two diverse cultures. The Veritans were renowned for their strict hierarchical structures and unwavering discipline, 
something the more democratic humans found both intimidating and perplexing. Conversely, the human's predisposition for independent thought, creativity, and empathetic leadership was viewed by many Veritans as a puzzling lack of discipline. Yet, as time passed, they started to respect and appreciate each other's strengths. Bonds of camaraderie were forming, some Veritans even developing a sense of respect, if not outright friendship, for their human counterparts. However, Despite the positive advancements, there was an elephant in the room that everyone was acutely aware of, the issue of General Zorvan. His rebellion had jolted the Veritans working with humans, forcing them to question their newfound alliance. Every new attack by Zorvan was a harsh reminder that there were those amongst their race who did not see the humans as allies, but as vermin to be eradicated. Amidst the growing tension, a high-level military meeting was underway. Human and Veritan officers, representatives of the Alliance's two halves, huddled together around a state-of-the-art hollow table. They pored over the glowing 3D maps and charts that showed their sectors of influence, their faces cast in an ominous azure hue. The main agenda was Zorvan's recent series of attacks. We have to do something, Admiral Kira, the leading human military figure, declared, her tone brokering no argument. The frequency of Zorvan's attacks is escalating. The stakes are not just our ships and personnel, but also our new allies' trust in this alliance. Before any concrete strategies could be deliberated, the room's communication console chirped, its shrill sound slicing through the tense silence. The words, urgent update, flashed on the screen, drawing everyone's attention. A grim report followed. Zorvan had launched another attack on a human outpost. The news hit everyone like a physical blow. Admiral Kira's face hardened, her eyes glinting with resolute determination. We're doubling the patrols, she decided, her voice ringing out clear and strong. Send our best cruisers to the most affected regions. We need to show our people, both humans and Veritans, that we're doing everything we can to ensure their safety. A chorus of affirmations echoed throughout the room. The task was clear, though daunting. They needed to hunt down Zorvan to neutralize this threat. Yet to do that, they first needed to find him, something that had proven to be more difficult than they had anticipated. As the officers filed out of the room, a sense of unity and resolve filled the air. The hunt for Zorvan had officially begun, and the stakes had never been higher. A delicate proposition. Within the secure walls of his council quarters, Ambassador Solane found himself standing in a room bathed in the soft glow of the setting twin suns. Solane, a seasoned diplomat and representative of the humans, had spent countless hours in this space deliberating decisions that would shape the course of his race's future. Today was no different, and yet the weight of the matters at hand felt heavier than ever before. Two human security officers, their crisp uniforms, sharply contrasting with the room's warm tones, were in the middle of their briefing. One of them was Captain Arlen, a veteran intelligence officer whose reputation for impeccable intel had earned him the ambassador's respect. We have a solid lead on Zorvan's location, Ambassador. Arlen began, his voice steady and matter-of-fact. Our spies within the Council and the Orinthian political establishment have overheard whispers of their alliance with Zorvan there's a strong possibility that they've provided him with a safe haven. The news did not surprise Solane, yet it left a bitter taste in his mouth. The Orinthians, once respectable members of the council, now reduced to conspirators in such a treacherous plot. We're dispatching a stealth reconnaissance ship to confirm the intel, Arlen continued. We should have concrete information in a day or so. After a moment of thoughtful silence, Solane turned his attention to the other officer in the room, General Merrick the de facto military advisor to the human Veritan joint operation. What's our strategy, Merrick? Selene asked. Merrick, a broad-shouldered man with a granite-like countenance, unrolled a hollow map on the table. It showed the targeted sectors along the human Veritan border, the sites of Zorvan's latest attacks. We need to prevent Zorvan from causing any more damage, preferably by getting him to stand down willingly. To this end, Merrick proposed a daring idea. A direct appeal to Zorvan from Ambassador Varro. His reasoning was simple. Varro, a seasoned diplomat respected by both Veritans and humans, might be able to persuade Zorvan to surrender peacefully. If this failed, he could at least negotiate a ceasefire to prevent further bloodshed. 
Solane considered Merrick's unorthodox proposal. It was risky, audacious even, but it could potentially conclude this crisis without escalating violence. Later that evening, he shared his thoughts with Varro during a private conversation. Solane knew he was asking much from the Veriton, but the hope for a peaceful resolution resonated within him. Varro, Solane began, I need you to use your Veriton links and back channels to set up a meeting with Zorvan. Varro hesitated, his concerns evident. Solane, I'm not even certain where Zorvan is hiding. How am I supposed to set up a meeting? He asked, worry etching lines onto his face. I trust your ingenuity, Varro, Solane responded. I believe you can find a way to reach him. Your past experiences, your connections, they might just prove to be the key we need to unlock this impasse. Varro mulled over Solane's words, his expression contemplative. Even if I could reach him, I'm not sure Zorvan would agree to meet me, he said, his voice heavy with worry. Given my ties to the Council and the humans, he might see me as an enemy. Solane nodded in understanding. This is a gamble, Varro, I know, but it's a risk we may have to take for peace. If there is even the slightest chance that your voice could sway Zorvan, we must pursue it. Despite his concerns, Varro agreed to undertake the delicate mission. He was filled with reluctance, aware of the potential dangers and uncertainties ahead. Yet, he understood the gravity of the situation. If there was any chance to end this conflict without more violence, it was a risk he was willing to take. Later, Solane found himself gazing at the setting suns, their light fading into the encroaching darkness. In many ways, it mirrored the situation at hand. It was a race against the dying light, a desperate struggle to bring peace before the shadows of war engulfed them all. With a final glance at the darkening sky, Solane turned his attention back to the task at hand. He had to prepare for the upcoming council assembly, where he planned to expose the Orinthians' treachery and propose a course of action. The road ahead was fraught with challenges, but Solane was prepared. The game had changed, and the hunt for Zorvan was entering a critical phase. Council sessions were never easy, and today's was especially heated. Ambassador Solane found himself in the thick of it, his words carving through the chaos of opinions and counter-opinions that echoed around the Grand Hall. He stood in the center, the representative of a nascent human Veritan alliance, and called for unity in the face of adversity. I stand here today, Solane began, not just as a representative of the Veritans or the humans, but as a voice for peace in our galaxy. We face a renegade threat in the form of General Zorvan. He not only presents danger to us, but he also breeds discord among the Council races. He is an enemy to peace, to prosperity, and to the unity that we have struggled to build over the years. A murmur ran through the Council. They were all aware of Zorvan's actions. The news of his attacks had been the source of many restless nights. But it is not just about Zorvan. It's about those who support him those who provide him with resources and safe havens, those who allow his reign of terror to continue. Solane continued, his gaze fixed on the empty seats of the Orinthians. We have credible evidence that suggests that the Orinthians have resigned from the Council to align themselves with Zorvan. They're aiding a renegade, enabling his attacks and fostering chaos. The murmur escalated to shocked whispers. Accusations were one thing, but to have evidence was a different matter entirely. I propose a trade embargo and severe sanctions against the Orinthians until they come forward and address these accusations. I propose a unified front against Zorvan and his allies. The Galactic Council was formed to maintain peace, to unite us. Let us stand together against those who threaten our harmony. The hall erupted in a cacophony of voices. Some council members voiced their agreement while others denounced it as an unnecessary escalation but Solane had made his point. I also extend an invitation to the Orinthians. If they deny these accusations, let them return to the Council and address them. Let them clarify their stand. If they are not allies to Zorvan, let them prove it. The Council session closed amidst a whirlwind of debate and tension. The coming days would reveal how the Council would respond to Solan's proposal and the evidence presented. But one thing was certain. The hunt for Zorvan had brought the Council to a crucial crossroads. In the midst of the chaos, Solane could only hope that Varro would succeed in his mission and that the Council would unify against the rising threats.
The future of the galaxy seemed to hang in the balance, but Selene was no stranger to challenges. He was prepared to face whatever came next, his determination fueled by the hope of a peaceful resolution. From the solitary confines of a modest shuttle, Ambassador Varro's gaze is glued to the spectacle of Verita shrinking into a sea of distant stars. As the artificial intelligence on board gently indicates the estimated time of arrival, his heartbeat synchronizes with the low hum of the shuttle's engine, each throb a stark reminder of the monumental task ahead. Meanwhile, on a classified human outpost nestled in a remote corner of the galaxy, a hive of activity hums around the progress of a singular stealth ship. The Phantom, having launched under the Shroud of Secrecy just two days prior, carries on board a precious cargo. Hope. The weight of their task is palpable to Captain Layla Harper and Navigator Luca Ward, the only two souls aboard the ship. Every passing minute sees them venturing deeper into the uncharted territory, their target a speculative set of coordinates believed to host Zorvan's elusive base. A growing sense of unease and excitement fills the air, both on the Phantom and the distant outpost, their shared tension carried through the vacuum of space. Once they reach the edge of the system, the Phantom gracefully exits hyperspace, the surreal transition punctuating the magnitude of their mission. As the blue star shines against the vessel's hull, their scanners surge to life, their cyclopean eye seeking the signature of their quarry. Back at the outpost, every heart is in throats, every breath held as they await the results. Within the Phantom, Layla and Luca exchange determined glances, their minds and hearts racing in tandem with the relentless scan. The ghost of Zorvan seems to linger in every corner, every distant celestial body, but the scanner's beep continues, devoid of the confirmation they seek. Back at the outpost, the tension escalates. Officers hover over their stations, eyes glued to their monitors as the incoming data is analyzed in real time. The hunt for Zorvan has begun in earnest, their efforts a symbol of the collective resistance against chaos and warmongering. The silence inside the Phantom is deafening, the monotonous rhythm of the scanner reaching an almost unbearable pitch. As the blue star grows in size, a crescendo of excitement builds within them. Then, breaking the silence, Luca's voice echoes through the ship. I'm picking something up on sensors, he announces a hint of disbelief lining his tone. The faint whisper of discovery sends a ripple of exhilaration through them, and back at the outpost, a wave of anticipation crashes against the shores of hope. The game-changing revelation they've been hoping for may finally be within their grasp, the potential turning point in their pursuit of peace. The hunt for Zorvan might just be nearing its climax. If you're new to this story, Please check out the playlist in the description and feel free to start from the beginning. The Stealth Operations The human stealth ship, the Phantom, rested at the edge of the newly named Zephyra system, a stone's throw from the Orinthian territory. Its mission, to observe and report on the activities surrounding Zorvan's base, had just begun. Two of humanity's best, Captain Layla Harper and Navigator Luca Ward, were at the helm of this clandestine operation. The ship's computer hummed quietly, the soft glow of the holographic display casting an ethereal light within the confines of the bridge. Layla, with her sharp eyes and years of reconnaissance experience, scanned the intercepted data streams. Luca, an expert in decryption and data analysis, worked closely with her, sifting through the endless sea of information. The duo had been stationed on the outskirts of Zorvan's suspected base for the last few days, and the data was beginning to mount. They tracked ship movements, recording departures, arrivals, and anomalies, attempting to discern patterns in the chaos. They also intercepted a flurry of encrypted transmissions, their origins and destinations shrouded by layers of Veritan ciphering. It's like trying to see through a storm, Luca muttered, his fingers dancing over the touch-sensitive control panel. The first steps are always the hardest, Layla replied, a determined look in her eyes. We're charting the unknown. It's a matter of time before we start connecting the dots. As the days turned into nights and back into days, the Phantom remained a silent observer. It floated amidst the vastness of space, a ghost among the stars, while its crew tirelessly worked to unravel the shroud of mystery around General Zorvan. They made some headway, identifying key points of interest and potential leads, but much of Zorvan's operations remained hidden. 
The tension inside the Phantom was palpable as the reality of their situation settled in. They were alone in hostile space, working against the clock, and an enemy who was always a step ahead. The risk was tremendous, but so was the potential reward. If they could glean enough information to halt Zorvan's campaign, they might end the strife plaguing the Galactic Council. Every piece of data they captured was relayed back to the Human Military Command, offering insights and potential paths forward. Some bits were more interesting than others. A regular outgoing transmission to a distant star system hinted at the possibility of an off-site command center, or perhaps an ally in Zorvan's grand scheme. The crew of the Phantom understood their role in the grand scheme of things. Their work was the first step in a greater offensive, a counter-move against a formidable enemy. In this game of interstellar chess, they were the advance pawns, gathering the intelligence necessary to strategize and strike back. We're at the cusp of something big. Layla's voiced her thoughts aloud, her gaze fixed on the holographic display showing an overview of the Zephyra system. I can feel it too, Luca said, pausing in his work. Every intercepted message, every ship movement, it's all part of a larger puzzle. Let's just hope we can solve it in time, Layla said, a hard edge to her voice. For now, the Phantom would continue its covert operations, every second bringing humanity a step closer to understanding Zorvan's plans. Varro's Leads Ambassador Varro stood at the window of his chambers in the Galactic Council headquarters, looking out at the sprawling cityscape below. The decision to seek out General Zorvan was not one he had taken lightly. It entailed a delicate dance of negotiations and danger, threading the needle between his loyalties to the Council, humanity, and his Veritan kin. Knowing he couldn't carry out this task openly, Varro called upon some old acquaintances. Some were loyalists, others separatists, all a part of a sprawling web that connected the Veritans scattered across the galaxy. He asked for information, for a way to reach Zorvan without drawing the attention of the very people who sought to destroy him. Slowly, the pieces began to fall into place. Contacts returned messages, discrete data drops were arranged, and a tentative trail began to form. Each lead offered a small, cautious step forward, bringing him closer to the renegade general. Meanwhile, he maintained his duties as an ambassador, attending meetings and consultations. He was a diplomatic beacon of unity in the midst of turmoil, even as he quietly navigated the undercurrents of rebellion and revolution. On one such day, in a quiet corner of the council headquarters, Varro met with Kale, a seasoned Veritan operative. Kale, a former comrade in the Veritan military, had managed to maintain a line of communication with some of Zorvan's followers. His eyes held an intense glint, reflecting the weight of the information he carried. Zorvan has been gathering forces on the outskirts of Orinthian space, Kale revealed. He has sympathizers there. Varro nodded, processing the information. Can you set up a meeting? Varro asked, his gaze firm on Kale. Kale shifted uncomfortably before responding. I can send a message, but there's no guarantee he'll agree to meet. Do it, Varro insisted. We need to end this crisis peacefully. In the following days, Varro continued to trace the breadcrumbs left by Zorvan's movements. He walked a thin line, balancing his allegiance to the council and his intent to prevent a more loss of life that achieved nothing. The search consumed him. Every bit of information, every potential meeting, every report of Zorvan's attacks made him more resolute. He navigated the maze of contacts and coded messages, spurred on by a desperate need to prevent further bloodshed. Back in his quarters, he spent countless hours staring at a holographic display, a constellation of information that represented Zorvan's activities. His fingers traced the potential routes, the movements of Zorvan's fleets, the whispers of dissent echoing from the farthest reaches of the galaxy. One evening, a coded message blinked on his display, breaking the monotony. It was from Kale. Zorvan will meet. Coordinates to follow. Varro stared at the message, a strange mix of relief and apprehension washing over him. The chance for a peaceful resolution was within grasp, but the journey ahead was far from over. As Varro prepared to plunge into the depths of possible enemy territory, the weight of his mission bore down on him. The next steps he would take could drastically alter the course of Zorvan's warmongering, for better or for worse. The stakes had never been higher. May the stars guide us towards peace, 
Varro murmured, staring into the cosmic abyss beyond his window, the future as uncertain as the dark expanse of the universe itself. Admiral Kira's Ambush In the dark expanse of space, Admiral Kira's command cruiser, the Prometheus, held a quiet vigilance. They were positioned strategically, near the latest reports of Zorvan's fleet activity, a bustling human trade route. The shadow of anticipation loomed over the ship as the crew prepared for the probability of an imminent encounter. Admiral Kira was a seasoned commander, known for her strategic acumen and unwavering resolve. The thought of Zorvan and his fleet wreaking havoc on innocent traitors was a spur that he could not ignore. It was time for a bold move, and Kira was ready to make it. She studied the vast 3D map projected in the command center. The trade route was marked with a streak of blue, weaving its way through planets, asteroids, and stars. Kira's fleet was a green dot, lying in wait in the black expanse of the universe. The red dots, indicative of potential enemy activity, were ominously absent for now. We've reinforced our patrols, said Commander Lorne, her second in command. Our intelligence suggests that they might strike within the next few cycles. We're ready, Admiral. Kira nodded, her gaze fixed on the map. Good. Our aim is not to destroy them, but to capture them. We need prisoners for interrogation. We need to understand Zorvan's game. Days turned into nights, and still, they waited. The patience of the crew was tested, but they held their ground. The tedium of waiting was better than the alternative of an unprepared encounter. Finally, an alert sounded. The ship's sensors had picked up the telltale signs of an incoming Veriton cruiser, matching Zorvan's fleet's known signatures. The anticipation aboard the Prometheus grew to an almost tangible level. Admiral Kira straightened up, her sharp eyes scanning the updated map. The moment they had been waiting for had arrived. Battle stations, everyone, Kira commanded, her voice steady and authoritative. Ready the disruptor cannons. Prepare to engage. The Veriton cruiser moved closer, still unaware of the trap they were flying into. As soon as they entered the effective range of their weapons, Kiran gave the order to fire. The disruptor cannons fired a series of controlled, non-lethal blasts, aiming to disable the cruiser's propulsion and weapons system. The cruiser was caught off guard. The surprise attack left them disoriented, providing an opening for the human forces. Launch the boarding pods, ordered Kira. Special teams trained for such missions were dispatched. Their goal to board, secure the Veriton cruiser, and take the crew into custody. The operation was swift and efficient. The Veriton cruiser was soon under human control, its crew members apprehended. A wave of relief washed over Admiral Kira. This was a significant victory. Aboard the captured cruiser, human forces began the process of securing the ship and the prisoners. They were careful, knowing well the reputation of the Veriton soldiers. The mission was far from over. Meanwhile, Admiral Kira sent a message to the Galactic Council, informing them about their successful operation. We have taken a renegade Veriton cruiser and its crew into custody, she reported. We will begin the interrogation process to gather more information about Zorvan's activities. It was a significant win for the humans and the Galactic Council. It was the first time they had managed to capture a part of Zorvan's fleet. The morale among the human forces was visibly boosted. Yet Admiral Kira knew they were far from the end of their struggle. The capture of a single cruiser, while significant, was only a small step towards understanding and countering Zorvan's true plan. There was much more to do, and the path ahead remained fraught with danger and uncertainty. But for now, they had won a battle, and it was a victory worth celebrating. If you're new to this story, please check out the playlist in the description and feel free to start from the beginning. Aftermath of the Capture Following the successful capture of the Veriton cruiser, the atmosphere aboard the Prometheus was electric. It was a significant victory, their first real breakthrough against Zorvan's fleet, and the crew reveled in the triumph. Yet for Admiral Kira and her senior officers, the capture signaled the beginning of a new phase, one fraught with challenges and fraught with potential insight into Zorvan's operations. In the secure detention area, the captured Veritans were held under strict security measures. They were fighters, loyal to Zorvan, their hardened demeanor a testament to the many battles they had been through. Yet, 
There was a visible edge of fear in their eyes. They were now in enemy territory, their fate uncertain. While the human forces celebrated their victory, Ambassador Solon received the news with a sense of relief and renewed hope. It was a turning point, one that could potentially sway the Veritans still loyal to the Council against Zorvan. He wasted no time in presenting this development to the Galactic Council, highlighting the importance of this success in their fight against Zorvan. The capture of a Veritan cruiser from Zorvan's fleet demonstrates our determination to protect our territories and our people, Solane announced to the Council. We must use this opportunity to learn as much as possible about Zorvan's plans and use this information to counteract his destructive activities. Back on the Prometheus, the interrogation of the captured Veritans was underway. Admiral Kira, with her seasoned intelligence officer, Lieutenant Shira, was careful to ensure that the interrogations were fair but thorough. Shira, a skilled polyglot and a seasoned intelligence officer, was adept at handling such complex situations. We need information, not resentment, Admiral Kira instructed her. These Veritans are soldiers, just like us. Treat them with respect, but be persistent. We need to know everything about Zorvan's plans. In the dimly lit interrogation room, Shira began the process, her calm demeanor in stark contrast to the apprehensive Veritan soldiers. She engaged them in conversations, subtly navigating towards the information they needed. The Veritans were initially reticent, their loyalty to Zorvan apparent. But as the hours turned into days, cracks in their resistance began to appear. As the interrogations progressed, important pieces of information started to emerge. Zorvan was indeed planning something big, although the captured soldiers did not have detailed information. Yet, every bit of information was crucial. It was a complex puzzle that was slowly taking shape. Meanwhile, on the Veritan homeworld, news of the capture reached the ears of the Veritan command. The public sentiment, already tense due to Zorvan's activities, became more divided. Some saw this as proof that Zorvan was leading them down a destructive path. Others viewed it as a declaration of war by the humans, further fueling their resentment. For Ambassador Varro, the news brought a mixture of relief and concern. It was a positive development in their struggle against Zorvan, but it also meant an escalation in tension. It put additional pressure on his mission to reach out to Zorvan. In the Galactic Council, Debates raged on regarding the captured cruiser. Some council members were jubilant, seeing this as a major victory. Others were more cautious, recognizing the delicate situation they were now in. They needed to tread carefully. One wrong move could potentially ignite the volatile situation into a potential all-out conflict again. As the days passed, the captured cruiser's information was meticulously analyzed and cross-referenced, revealing patterns and possibilities. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly falling into place. They were yet to see the complete picture, but each new revelation brought them a step closer to understanding Zorvan's endgame. And so, the aftermath of the capture marked a period of intense activity, filled with anticipation and determination. It was a window of opportunity they had earned, and they were intent on making the most of it. The hunt for Zorvan was far from over, but for now, they had gained a crucial edge. Varro's Pursuit and Challenges Varro set forth on his mission with a sense of deep trepidation. It wasn't the danger that gnawed at his nerves, but the prospect of facing his fellow Veritans. He would not be greeted as a comrade, but viewed as a turncoat, a pawn of the humans and the Galactic Council. His contact on Orinthia was a former acquaintance, Vosh. He wasn't sure what drew Vosh to Zorvan's cause, but Varro hoped their shared past might help bridge the divide. The negotiations for a meeting with Zorvan were delicate, fraught with tension and suspicion. Vosh was careful, always keeping a safe distance, never committing to more than vague suggestions. But Varro was patient, employing all his diplomatic skill to prove his sincerity. Word of the successful human ambush of a Veritan cruiser arrived amidst the tense negotiations. The news gave Varro a much-needed leverage. The humans had managed to capture an entire Veritan crew. The crew's knowledge could prove a significant asset in tracking down Zorvan. The balance of power was shifting, and not in Zorvan's favor. The humans' victory won't buy their safety, Varro. It will only infuriate Zorvan. 
Vosh cautioned during one of their secretive meetings. Perhaps, Varro conceded. But it's a sign that the Council and the humans are not to be underestimated. It's a call for Zorvan to reassess his strategies. Vosh regarded Varro with a thoughtful expression, his deep-set eyes reflecting the dim light in the clandestine meeting place. Zorvan will not appreciate you using this as leverage, Varro. I am not here to make Zorvan appreciate anything, Varro replied evenly. I am here to prevent more violence, more deaths. His words hung heavy in the air between them. Varro was well aware that the weight of his mission was much more than an ideological dispute. Lives were at stake, both Veritan and human. The future of his race hinged on the decisions that would be made in the coming days. Vosh finally agreed to arrange a meeting with Zorvan, but he warned Varro. Zorvan will not be swayed easily. He believes in his cause with all his heart. You must be prepared for that. Varro accepted the caution with a nod, his thoughts turning to the daunting task ahead. He was aware of the challenge, yet he also knew that he carried the hope of peace within his grasp. He was not just negotiating for the humans or the Galactic Council, but for his people, the Veritans. As he prepared for the meeting, Varro couldn't help but reflect on the weight of his actions. He held the future of his people in his hands. His success or failure would shape the fate of not only the Veritans, but countless other races within the Galactic Council. This thought was both humbling and terrifying, but it drove him forward. Varro set out to meet Zorvan armed with the knowledge of the humans' victory and the fragile hope of peace. He knew the odds were against him. He knew Zorvan was a formidable opponent, driven by a deeply entrenched belief in Veritan supremacy. Yet he had to try, for the sake of his people and the future of the galaxy. As Varro's shuttle hummed through space, he gazed out into the blackness, lost in thought. The stars twinkled, distant and cold, oblivious to the turmoil within his mind. Ahead lay an uncertain path, fraught with risk and the potential for disaster. But there was also a glimmer of hope a chance for peace, and Varro was determined to seize it. As he journeyed to the clandestine meeting, he went over the talking points in his mind. He needed to convince Zorvan of the futility of his campaign against the humans. With a captured cruiser and its crew in human hands, it was only a matter of time before they located Zorvan. Upon landing, Varro was met by Zorvan's trusted officers who led him to a meeting room. The room was austere, reflecting the grim situation they found themselves in. Zorvan, the renegade general, stood at the far end of the room, his imposing figure a demonstration of his military prowess. Varro wasted no time, addressing Zorvan directly. The humans have captured one of your cruisers, Zorvan. He began, not mincing words. They have your soldiers, your technology. It's only a matter of time before they track you down. Zorvan's reaction was unreadable, his face a stoic mask. He seemed to digest the information, a contemplative silence hanging in the air. And what do you suggest, Varro? He finally asked, his voice steady. I suggest you consider negotiating, Varro answered, maintaining eye contact. End this campaign. It doesn't have to escalate further. Zorvan seemed to consider this for a moment, his gaze shifting to a distant point. Negotiate? He echoed an edge to his voice. With the humans who stole our technology, desecrated our trust? I understand your grievances, Zorvan, Varro said, his voice calm. But this war, it's tearing us apart. It's turning the galaxy against us. We're stronger united, not divided. The room fell silent once more, Zorvan deep in thought. The tension was palpable as Varro waited for his response, knowing that the future of their race, and possibly the stability of the entire galaxy, hung in the balance. Meanwhile, back in human space, the information gleaned from the captured cruiser was being put to use. Patrols were increased, defenses strengthened, and counteroffensives planned. The captured Veritans, despite their initial resistance, were starting to cooperate more, the realization of their dire situation slowly sinking in. The humans, it seemed, were slowly but surely closing in on Zorvan. Back at the Council, Selene was making preparations of his own. Upon hearing of Varro's risky meeting with Zorvan, he had used his influence to arrange an emergency council meeting. If Varro could convince Zorvan to consider negotiations, they would need to be ready to act quickly. As Varro left the meeting with Zorvan, he felt a mix of hope and anxiety. Zorvan had agreed to consider his proposal, 
a small victory, but the final decision was yet to be made. As he journeyed back, he knew that the coming days would be critical. The capture of the Veriton cruiser had indeed changed the dynamics of their standoff with Zorvan. The hunt for the renegade general was entering a critical stage, and everyone, from the human territories to the Galactic Council, held their breath, awaiting the outcome of these renewed negotiation attempts. Alone in his office at the Galactic Council Solane, his gaze fixed on the holographic star chart displayed before him, he pondered over the inexplicable cosmic occurrences. The chart flickered, revealing the vast expanse of the galaxy. Two dots, once brightly glowing, now dimmed to near obscurity. Those were stars, each located in different reaches of the galaxy. Both had gone dark without explanation. His brow furrowed in concern as he tapped on the latest report that confirmed the disheartening news. Another star had dimmed, its light extinguished as if someone had doused a cosmic candle. Selene could feel the gravity of the situation pressing down on him. These were natural cosmic bodies, each one burning with a ferocity that defied human comprehension. The inexplicable extinction of two such stars sent a chill running down his spine. There were no immediate answers, no hypotheses that could explain this unnatural phenomenon. He glanced back at the star chart his eyes gravitating towards the now darkened points, a silent testament to the mystery that was unraveling. One star was a curiosity, a cosmic anomaly that spurred concern. But two? That was more than just a coincidence. The implications were potentially dire, but Solane knew he couldn't afford to be distracted. As unsettling as these darkened stars were, he had more immediate crises to deal with. The Decision to Investigate the darkened stars had been a topic of discussion amongst the Galactic Council for a while now. The unusual phenomenon had raised concerns, not only because of its inexplicability, but also due to the fear of the unknown it represented. The second report of another star's disappearance had only increased the sense of unease. Counselor Lauren, representative from the Verlo star system, voiced his worry. We must investigate this matter at once. Ignoring these incidents could be perilous. His concerns were echoed by other council members. The room buzzed with tense whispers, everyone's eyes fixed on Solane. As the leading figure of the Galactic Council, his decisions carried significant weight. I agree with Councillor Lauren, Solane said, his tone firm and decisive. This is an issue we cannot ignore. It's time to delve into this mystery. The room fell into silence. A wave of relief washed over some of the councillors, a sense of foreboding over others. The decision was made, and there was no turning back. I'm commissioning the Icarus for this mission, Selene continued. His gaze swept over the council members, a determined glint in his eyes. It's one of our newest and fastest vessels. If there are answers to be found, the Icarus and her crew will find them. Counselor Tiala of the Hisia Star System spoke up. The journey to the edge of our territory, it's going to take time, even with the Icarus's speed. Solane nodded. Four days at maximum speed, he confirmed. Every moment we delay, we risk another star going dark. With that, the meeting was adjourned. The Icarus was prepared for its journey to the edge of the known galaxy, equipped with the best technology and a crew ready to face the unknown. As the ship powered up its engines, ready for the journey that lay ahead, there was an air of apprehension, but also a glimmer of hope. It was a step toward unraveling the mystery that had haunted the Council, a mission filled with peril, but a necessary one nonetheless. The ship's engines roared to life, leaving behind the safety of the space station. The destination was set, and the Icarus hurtled towards the coordinates of the first darkened star. A new chapter in this saga was about to begin. In the cold, vast expanse of space, the human vessel Icarus charted its course toward the site of the inexplicably darkened stars. This exploratory ship, under Solane's directive, had embarked on a mission to solve this cosmic mystery. The crew consisted of top-notch scientists and veteran pilots, each hand-picked for their expertise. They had been traveling through hyperspace for days, with only the hum of the ship's engines and the faint murmurs of crew members echoing through the steel corridors. As they neared their destination, the tension amongst the crew grew palpable. Their mission was unprecedented, after all. 
As the Icarus dropped out of hyperspace, they were met with a sight that stole their breath away. The once bright star was now a dark void, a chilling and unnerving anomaly in the otherwise vibrant galaxy. Anything on the scanners? Captain Hale, a grizzled veteran with countless space missions under his belt, asked his sensor operator. The young officer shook his head, his face pale. Nothing, sir. It's like the star just vanished. The crew proceeded with their investigation, attempting to make sense of this perplexing phenomenon. Hours turned into days as they probed and scanned the region, collecting data but finding no answers. Then, without warning, alarms blared throughout the ship. The Icarus shook violently, throwing crew members off balance. A wall of static erupted on the communication console as the sensor operator yelled, Captain, unidentified vessels approaching fast. On the comm system, a strange, grating voice echoed, translated by the ship's systems into their language. Unidentified vessel, you are trespassing. Stand down and surrender. You are in Drac Dominion territory. Captain Hale could barely make out the shadowy figures on the radar, their size dwarfing the Icarus. He had never seen anything like them. Panic set in, but Hale kept his composure, barking orders to his crew to raise shields and prepare for evasive maneuvers. But it was too late. They were under attack. Hale turned to his communications officer. Send a distress signal to the Council. Let them know about the Drac Dominion. As the ship quaked under the enemy fire, the officer hastily complied. His voice shaking, he relayed their situation, mentioning the massive unidentified ships and the chilling warning from the attacking fleet. The Drac Dominion. In the midst of chaos and terror, the garbled message was sent, echoing into the void before the Icarus succumbed to the onslaught, disappearing in a bright explosion. At the Galactic Council's headquarters, Selene stared at the communicator, the received distress signal replaying in his head. The mention of the Drac Dominion filled him with a dread he hadn't felt in a long time. He knew then they were facing something much bigger than a rebellious Veritan general. A Historical Investigation after the chilling distress signal from the Icarus, the Galactic Council was in an uproar. Their fastest ship, sent to investigate a mystery, had stumbled upon a far greater and deadlier enigma. As the counselors bickered and panicked, Selene's voice cut through the noise. We need to know more. We need to know about this Drac Dominion. With an air of grim determination, Selene turned to the Galactic Librarians, the keepers of the knowledge of the universe. Their vast library housed data and records spanning millennia, including the history of extinct races and fallen empires. Find me everything you can about the Drac Dominion, Solane ordered. The librarians nodded, disappearing into the labyrinth of data, both digital and physical. Days turned into nights, and the librarians tirelessly sifted through countless records, data crystals, and holographic manuscripts. Then... Deep in the galactic annals, they discovered a cryptic record in a crystal memory storage device, a relic from the old galactic order. The information was sparse, the record fragmented, as if someone had attempted to erase it from existence. It mentioned an ancient conflict, a war that spanned the galaxy, and at the heart of this war was a formidable entity, a force so powerful it brought countless star systems to their knees, the Drac Dominion. The record spoke of vast fleets that blotted out the stars, of planets laid waste and civilizations erased from existence. It spoke of a united front, of the ancient races of the galaxy banding together to face the common enemy. In the final battle, the Drac Dominion was thought defeated, their mighty fleets vanquished, their dominion crumbled. The surviving races rejoiced, their unity turning from a necessity for survival into the foundation of a new order. The memory crystal ended there, the rest of the data lost to time or deliberate erasure, but the information it provided filled Selene with a sense of foreboding. It was clear now, they were not just facing a rebellious Veritan general, they were facing a threat thought extinct, an enemy that once brought the galaxy to the brink of extinction. The council chamber fell silent as Selene relayed the librarian's findings. The counselors, usually so verbose, had nothing to say. The silence was heavy, filled with the dread of the unknown, of facing an adversary that their ancestors had barely managed to defeat. But amidst the fear, Solane saw something else. Determination. They were the children of the survivors, after all. And if their ancestors could face this threat, so could they. A deadline for Zorvan. 
The Galactic Council Chamber was abuzz with chatter as the representatives awaited Solane's next course of action. The gravity of the Drac Dominion's reappearance was beginning to sink in, but so was the reality of their ongoing internal crisis, Zorvan's rebellion. Enough. Solane's voice boomed, instantly silencing the chamber. We have a deadline for Vero and Zorvan. It's time they understand that we are serious. Despite the pressing nature of the Drac threat, the Council couldn't ignore the potential civil war brewing within their borders. Zorvan had to be dealt with one way or another. Vero, you have three days to convince Zorvan to negotiate, Solane stated, his gaze sternly fixed on the Veritan representative. Failure to do so will result in us taking action. Vero swallowed hard, his scaly throat bobbing visibly. He had been confident of his ability to mediate a peaceful resolution, but Solan's ultimatum added an extra layer of pressure. Suddenly and without warning, the chamber's large hollow display flickered to life, showing a live feed from the ship Icarus, or rather, what was left of it. Its sleek silver hull was scorched and damaged. The crew, a mix of humans and veritans, looked as battered as their ship. Captain Hale, Selene acknowledged, his voice softer. The captain, though appearing bruised and weary on the screen, saluted Solane before taking a step forward. We made it back, but barely, he began, his voice hoarse. We lost good people out there. A heavy silence hung in the room. It was a moment of shared mourning, a collective intake of breath for the lives lost to a threat they were only beginning to understand. But we didn't come back empty-handed, Captain Hale continued, gesturing to a data storage device in his hand. We managed to collect substantial data on the Drac Dominion, it's worse than we could have imagined. With a series of swift commands, Hale transferred the data to the Council. As the information downloaded onto Solane's console, he felt the weight of the situation settle upon him. The Drac were not only a force from the past, they were a very real, very imminent threat. Hale had one last message to deliver. They know where we are, he murmured, his voice barely a whisper. They're coming for us. The chamber erupted in a frenzy of alarmed voices. If the Drac Dominion was on the move, then their problems just got a lot bigger. Selene's gaze hardened, and he slammed his fist on the table to silence the chamber. We faced adversity before, and we will do so again, he stated, his voice resonating with determination. Our ancestors fought the Drac Dominion, and now we must be ready to do the same. Zorvan's rebellion, the Drac Dominion's return, the survival of their civilizations, the weight of it all threatened to crush them. But as Selene looked around the room, he saw resolve in their eyes. It was a daunting road ahead, but they would face it together. Nestled within the distant reaches of the Zephyra system, Zorvan's enclave, a rebellion fortress, hummed with relentless activity. The stronghold, full of Veritan warriors, brilliant strategists, and resolute thinkers, was a testament to the unity sparked by Zorvan's unyielding vision of a new galactic order. In the heart of the command center, bathed in the cold glow of star maps and intricate hollow displays, Zorvan took in the intelligence relayed from his hidden sympathizers within the Galactic Council. His eyes darted across the words, absorbing the chilling details of the Drac Dominion's ominous emergence and the fate of the Icarus. His strategic mind turned over the new information, evaluating and recalculating. The Drac Dominion was not part of his plans, an unforeseen element that disrupted the balance. He had prepared for the Council's resistance, for Solane's dogged pursuit, even for the humans' unpredictable involvement. But this ancient, enigmatic enemy reappearing from the recesses of history, that was an unforeseen obstacle. I'm going to offer the Council and Selene a truce, Zorvan declared, his voice echoing in the stillness of the command center. His commanders turned to face him, expressions of surprise etching their features. A truce from Zorvan, especially toward Selene, was unprecedented. We will show them the strength of Veritans. We will unite our forces with the Council and the humans to meet this new threat. In return, we shall seek an amnesty while we unite to crush this Drac Dominion. The room descended into a stunned silence before his second-in-command. Takar broke it. You are certain of this, Zorvan? Gazing at the cosmic tapestry outside, Zorvan responded, Yes, contact Vero. I'll put my proposal to him. As Takar left to carry out the order, Zorvan stood alone 
the weight of his decision pressing on him. This was their chance for glory, a chance to show the Council and the humans the might of the Veritans. This was a chance to shape their destiny. If you're new to this story, please check out the playlist in the description below, and feel free to start from the beginning. In a quiet chamber in the Galactic Council headquarters, Varro watched as the hollow comlink flickered to life. The familiar figure of Zorvan, the proud Veritan rebel leader, materialized before him. The striking facial markings of the Veritan race were accentuated by the glow of the hollow projector, but it was Zorvan's eyes that held Varro's attention. They reflected a determination Varro remembered from their shared past. Zorvan began, his voice carrying an uncharacteristic edge of urgency. We need to unite, Varro. My strength has grown considerably since our paths diverged. I started with five Veritan cruisers. Today I command thirty ships, and my forces number over a hundred thousand. Veritans, yes, but also individuals from races sympathetic to our cause. The revelation took Varro aback. He had known Zorvan was amassing power, but this was far beyond the Council's estimates. A fleet that size, if handled correctly, could be a significant asset against the Drac. I understand your initial reaction, Zorvan continued, reading Varro's surprise. It was necessary to keep our progress discreet. But now, with the Drac threat looming over us, I propose an alliance. Varro couldn't believe what he was hearing. Zorvan was offering to bring his rebel forces to fight alongside the Galactic Council, but alliances always had a price. And in return? Varro asked, already anticipating the answer. Amnesty, Zorvan replied simply, his eyes burning with resolve. For me, my commanders, and my soldiers. It was an audacious demand, but Varro could see the strategic benefits of Zorvan's offer. The Veritan's forces were considerable, and more importantly, they were ready to fight. But the Council, and more specifically Solane, would not be easily convinced. Zorvan's image faded from the comlink, leaving Varro alone with his thoughts. The proposal was risky, and he wasn't sure it was a gamble the Council was willing to take. But as he considered Zorvan's words, he knew they didn't have many options left. If they wanted to stand a chance against the Drac Dominion, they might have to accept Zorvan's help however unpalatable the idea might seem. Varro sighed, staring at the blank comlink. The challenges ahead were monumental. They had a formidable enemy approaching and an unpredictable ally offering assistance. But first he had to convince Solane, and that, he suspected, would be the most challenging task of all. The Temptation of Varro Even as the transmission from Zorvan ended, the screen flickered again. Varro stiffened, recognizing the distinctive Veritan insignia that appeared. It was another message from Zorvan, this one private, addressed solely to him. Varro. Zorvan's voice filled the room, strong and compelling as ever. I knew you back when you were a captain, a warrior. I've watched you turn into a diplomat, playing peacemaker amongst the council. But we both know you were meant for greater things. Images began to flood the display footage of Zorvan's fleet, Thirty Veritan cruisers gleaming under distant stars, and a throng of mixed species, all ready to pledge their allegiance to Zorvan's cause. The magnitude of Zorvan's forces was impressive, and the hidden implication was clear. They could be Varro's to command. I need strong leaders, Varro. People who understand our ways. I ask you to return to your roots. Stand with us. Remember your past glory, Varro. It can be yours again. Varro watched torn between loyalty to the Council and a longing for the old days of honor and bravery that Zorvan promised. He had been a respected captain, a warrior. The offer was tempting, playing on his nostalgia for the past and a yearning for respect and recognition. But he was a councilman now, bound by duty and loyalty to the Council and the peace they represented. Zorvan, he replied after a moment of silence, his voice steady. I respect your cause and I understand your motivations, but my place is with the Council. But even as he refused, Varro found himself revisiting the images of Zorvan's growing force, a thought lingering in his mind. What if he could reclaim the glory of his past, stand strong against this new threat? What if he could be more than just a diplomat? Inside the Galactic Council's war room, the atmosphere was tense, electric, the room, usually reserved for diplomatic meetings, had been hastily converted into a makeshift hub for war preparations. 
Holographic displays filled the air, showing intricate diagrams, data streams, and real-time intelligence reports. At the room's center, a group of high-ranking officials and military experts huddled around a large table, their faces etched with concern. Ancient, massive, and terrifyingly powerful, a scientist began, his voice echoing in the room as he gestured towards a model of a drac ship. Their size gives them formidable defenses and destructive firepower. Their weapon systems, from what we've managed to analyze, are unlike anything we've encountered. Nods of agreement echoed around the table. The data from the Icarus encounter had provided invaluable insights into the DRAC technology. Their ships were vast, slow-moving fortresses in space, their weapons capable of obliterating planets. But their size is also their weakness. Another voice chimed in. A seasoned captain, known for his strategic acumen, pointed at a graph showing the DRAC ship's speed. They may have extraordinary firepower, but they lack in speed. Our hyperspace drives operate at a pace they cannot match. Murmurs filled the room as this new information sunk in. The Icarus had managed to escape by exploiting this very weakness. They couldn't outgun the Drac, but they had outrun them. The Drac's slow, lumbering nature might be their undoing. The mood in the room shifted subtly, a faint glimmer of hope emerging amidst the apprehension. They have smaller fighter craft too, but again, their speed is low, limited to local sorties and defense, the captain continued, directing their attention to another display. The model of a Drac fighter was significantly smaller than the colossal ships, but their design spoke of the same brutal efficiency. But make no mistake, he warned, his gaze sweeping over the assembled officials. They are planet killers, these Drac. If we allow them to get within striking distance of our worlds, the consequences would be catastrophic. The scientist added, Moreover, it will take them months to mobilize their forces to our territories. We have a window, albeit a small one, to prepare ourselves. If we're smart, if we're fast, we can turn their weakness against them. As the meeting progressed, the threat of the Drac Dominion began to crystallize in the minds of everyone present. The Drac were a formidable foe, their ships literal behemoths of destruction, but they weren't invincible. Their slow speed presented an opportunity, a chink in the otherwise impervious armor, and it was a chink they intended to exploit. A glimpse of hope. Attention in the war room shifted as the lights dimmed and a hollow recording from the Icarus flickered into view. The bridge of the Icarus was a scene of chaos. Warning lights flashed, alarms wailed, and officers shouted commands and reports, their voices strained with fear and determination. Captain Hale stood resolute at the helm, his face a mask of calm in the tempest. Brace for impact, he ordered, his voice rising above the cacophony just as a drac beam crashed into their shields. The image lurched, showing the Icarus shaking violently from the impact, panels sparking and crew members tossed from their seats. Hale, hanging onto the console, barked his next order. Return fire, hit them with everything we have. The Icarus retaliated, launching a volley of torpedoes at the Drac ship. The audience watched as the missiles struck true, causing the Drac vessel to shudder. It was a small victory, but it brought a momentary reprieve. We're outmatched. Hale conceded, his eyes fixed on the enemy ship on the display. Engineering, I need a hyperspace jump. The smallest you can manage. Just get us out of their immediate reach. Initiating micro jump in three, two, one. The technician's voice echoed in the room as the recording showed the stars outside the Icarus's windows blurring, the ship entering hyperspace. A collective breath was drawn in the Council's war room as they watched the Icarus escape the clutches of the Drac Dominion. The recording resumed after the micro jump, showing the crew assessing the damage and initiating repairs. Hale stood before the hollow screen, his expression grim as he observed the slow moving Drac vessels on the display. They're moving, but they're slow, very slow, he observed. This revelation prompted them to launch a series of sensor sweeps, analyzing every detail they could glean about the Drac's weapons, ships, and speed. Our speed is our advantage, he declared, a glimmer of hope in his voice. We can't outgun them, but we can outrun them. We'll live to fight another day. As the recording ended, the war room was silent for a moment, the weight of the situation sinking in. The Drac's slow speed, their ship's lack of agility, provided a window of opportunity. It gave them a chance to fight, to prepare. 
to strategize. From the brink of destruction, the Icarus has provided us a lifeline, said Selene, standing tall and breaking the silence in the room. We've learned more from this engagement than centuries of speculation. Now it's time to use this knowledge and turn the tables. The Drac are coming, but they won't find us unprepared. The Proposal to Selene in the cool and quiet ambiance of Selene's office, Varro stood before the council leader, the weight of his recent conversation with Zorvan heavy on his shoulders. I've spoken with Zorvan, he began, the calm in his voice belying the tension underneath. Selene, his expression stony, studied Varro's face. And what does our rebellious Veriton have to say? Varro paused before responding, gathering his thoughts. He wants amnesty for himself, his commanders, and his soldiers. The statement hung in the air, a challenge to the council's authority. Salon's brow furrowed. Amnesty, he echoed, the incredulity clear in his voice. After all he's done? Varro nodded. In return, he offers his forces to fight against the Drac. He has grown stronger, Selene. His fleet numbers 30 ships, his army more than 100,000 strong. Veritan warriors, men and women from sympathetic races, all answering his call. There was a long pause as Solane absorbed this information. He moved to the window, his gaze falling on the bustling galactic council below. The enormity of the Drac threat and the audacity of Zorvan's proposition weighed heavily on him. Varro continued. He proposes that his forces take up forward positions. They could be the buffer between us and the Drac Dominion. If we are to face these Drac, numbers will matter, Solane. Solane turned back towards Varro his face showing no indication of his thoughts. Zorvan's rebellion has cost us greatly, Varro. Can we trust him not to turn on us at a crucial juncture? This amnesty, it's a big ask. Varro nodded, his gaze steady on Solane. I understand your concerns, Solane, but this is a different kind of war we're facing, an enemy like none we've ever encountered. If we don't unite now, there might not be a council or a rebellion to argue about later. Solane was silent for a moment his gaze thoughtful. You're suggesting we ally ourselves with a rebel with a traitor to face an alien threat? Yes, Varro affirmed, standing tall. Because I believe it is the best chance we have. There was a lengthy pause as Selene stared at Varro, a battle of wills playing out in the silence. Then slowly, Selene nodded. All right, Varro. I'm willing to consider this alliance, but not blindly. I need to talk to Zorvan myself, see the sincerity in his eyes. Varro breathed a sigh of relief, a tense knot uncoiling in his chest. I'll set up a meeting. Selene nodded, his gaze shifting to the vista beyond his window, his mind undoubtedly weighing the high-stakes gamble they were about to undertake. The Drac are coming, Varro, and they won't find us unprepared. As Varro exited Selene's office, the weight of his conversation with Selene heavy on his shoulders, he couldn't help but wonder about the upcoming meeting between Selene and Zorvan. This was uncharted territory, a perilous path they were embarking upon. It had to work, he thought to himself. The room exuded a quiet authority, subtly illuminated to accentuate the grandeur of its historical context. Intricate designs on the walls whispered tales of past interstellar treaties and alliances, while the vast window showcased the endless expanse of the cosmos, each star standing sentinel to the discussions within. Solane, the esteemed leader of the Galactic Council, walked in, the soft echo of his steps on the marble betraying the weight of his role. His face, a map of lines and contours, revealed a life immersed not only in stellar battles, but also in the equally challenging arena of galactic politics. Varro, standing by the window, started without preamble. The meeting has been scheduled in two days. Solane, pausing for a moment, inquired, and what of the murmurs regarding Zorvan's fleet? Varro nodded in affirmation. They are true. Since expressing his intent to unite with us, many have rallied to his cause. He now boasts a fleet surpassing a hundred vessels. That's considerable firepower, Selene mused, visibly impressed. These additional ships could greatly tilt the balance in our favor against the Drac onslaught. The location of the meeting remains Zorvan's choice, Varro added. Solane responded with understanding. Fair enough. Two days gives us ample preparation. It's crucial that our stand against the Drac is undivided and formidable. Drawing closer, Varro emphasized, 
Solane Zorvan's fleet is not just an addition, it's a force multiplier. With these ships, our defensive stance against the Drac becomes that much more robust. Solane pondered. While the tactical advantage is clear, I wonder about the political ramifications. Our histories with the Veritans, our past skirmishes. Can Zorvan genuinely prioritize this alliance over past grievances? Varro's gaze held conviction. In the face of the Drac, old enmities fade. While Zorvan undoubtedly seeks respect and recognition, the essence of survival, our collective survival, will guide him. A brief silence ensued as Selene weighed the implications. Vero aligning with Zorvan is pivotal, especially now. But it's a strategic move against a common foe. Vero, smiling faintly, responded, Exactly. If Zorvan stands with us, the Galactic Council gains a significant edge. Selene questioned further. But should Zorvan's terms surpass our limits? With a chuckle, Varro answered, Then we negotiate, find common ground, and ensure a future where the Drac is not the victor. Remember, we're on the same side. Zorvan might not be the ally we wanted, but he's the ally we need. Solane nodded, the weight of the upcoming meeting and the Drac threat heavy on his mind. The room, which moments ago was rife with uncertainty, now held an air of cautious optimism. Solaney, ever the leader, declared, In two days, we'll align our strategies. Varro, offering a reassuring gesture, stated, Uniting with Zorvan might be born out of necessity, but it's the strategy we must adopt now. The Council's Preparations The Council Chamber buzzed with a frenetic energy, a hive of activity as commanders, strategists, and experts darted between holographic displays, poring over a myriad of charts, star maps, and tactical simulations. At the head of the vast room, a monumental table curved in a half circle. Here, the most influential figures of the Galactic Council sat, including Solane, their faces illuminated by the soft glow of the projections. A hologram in the center, depicting a fleet arrangement, altered between two formations, one with just the Council's fleet, and another bolstered by Zorvan's forces. The difference was staggering, the latter showing a compact, formidable force capable of holding its ground against the Drac onslaught. Councillor Tylia, a renowned tactician, pointed to the formation with Zorvan's fleet. With the Veritan rebel forces, our chances of withstanding the initial Drac wave increase by a staggering 42%. Their guerrilla tactics and advanced cloaking technology could be a game-changer. A ripple of unease spread among the council members. Many shifted uncomfortably in their seats, the idea of allying with a former enemy clearly unsettling. We cannot deny the numbers, said General Lorne, a seasoned human war veteran with a face scarred from battles past. But trust is not built on data projections. Selene cleared his throat, bringing attention to himself. We're not asking for trust, merely a strategic alliance. Our primary goal remains, the survival of our civilizations. As murmurs of agreement rippled through the chamber, Counselor Grav, a towering figure with a mechanical arm, rose. Then let's discuss our reconnaissance mission. Gathering intel on the Drac's capabilities is paramount. Selene nodded, gesturing to a side panel. The display transitioned to show two impressive human cruisers and schematics for the stealth ships. We're dispatching two of our cruisers, and a total of three stealth ships to cover the most ground. Their primary objective is to venture deep into Drac territory and uncover the truth about their alleged star-killing weapon. A hush enveloped the hall. The weight of this mission, its significance, hung in the air, a palpable tension. A sharp, hawk-eyed admiral interjected, Are we sure about this? Sending stealth ships deep into enemy territory is risky. If they're captured... Selene raised a hand, silencing him. It's a calculated risk, but the potential reward, information about a weapon that could annihilate stars, is invaluable. We need to know if it exists and where. Shifting gears, Selene activated another projection, a detailed map of the galaxy's outer rim. He highlighted several systems. These are our most vulnerable points, the likeliest first contacts with the Drac. We need fortifications now. General Lorne stood, pointing at a few marked systems. Dispatch our heavy cruisers to these worlds. We'll create a layered defense, a bulwark that will buy us time. Counselor Taelia added, And not just military assets. We need supply routes, medical facilities, and infrastructure. It's not enough to defend. We need to sustain. 
As the meeting progressed, the chamber transformed into a nerve center of logistics and strategy. Routes were plotted, fleet formations adjusted, and supplies allocated. Hours seemed to blur, but when they finally adjourned, there was a collective sense of purpose in the air. Despite the looming drac threat, the Galactic Council had rallied, coming together with a renewed determination. As Selene left the chamber, he paused, gazing back at the busy room. The weight of leadership, the responsibility of billions of lives, weighed on him. But for the first time in weeks, there was also a glimmer of hope. Into the shadows, the vast expanse of space stretched out before the two human cruisers, the starry void punctuated by distant nebulas and the cold shimmer of remote stars. Their journey had taken them to the fringes of the Galactic Council's domain, skirting the boundaries of the sinister Drac territories. The majesty of the universe around them stood in stark contrast to the tension-laden environment within the cruisers. Commander Ilias paced the bridge of the lead cruiser, the Daedalus. His gaze constantly flitted to the star charts, showing their progress as they approached a vast asteroid field. These tumbling rocks and ice bodies would provide some cover, a strategic place to lie low. Prepare to go silent, he ordered crisply. All around him, officers and crew hurried to their stations. The cruiser dimmed as non-essential systems powered down, the humming of the engines dropping to a gentle purr. They were in silent mode, a state of near-complete stasis that made them virtually undetectable to enemy sensors. On the secondary cruiser, the Sentinel, Captain Carter was making similar preparations. As the ships drifted closer to the asteroid field, he opened a secure channel to the Daedalus. Daedalus, this is Sentinel. Ready for the operation. Carter's voice crackled over the comms. Commander Ilias nodded, responding. Roger that, Sentinel. Stand by for deployment. Inside the Daedalus, the cruiser's cavernous shuttle bay echoed with quiet anticipation. Here, crews of the three stealth ships waited for their briefing. These two-person vessels were sleek, designed for discretion and agility, the pinnacle of human stealth technology. Commander Ilias stepped onto a raised platform, his voice authoritative and reassuring. We're at the edge of the known universe, and beyond this point lies a mystery we need to unravel. Our mission is to discover the Drax's potential star-killing capabilities and get a closer look at their occupied worlds. Remember, stealth is your shield. Rely on your training and trust in each other. Lieutenant Mira, one of the stealth ship pilots, looked over to her co-pilot, Ensign Garo. Their eyes met in silent understanding. This was the mission they had trained for, a mission that could change the fate of the war. With the briefing concluded, crews took their positions. The massive bay doors of both cruisers groaned open, revealing the vast darkness of space. One by one, the stealth ships floated out, their engines a muted thrum in the silence of the void. A moment later, their advanced cloaking systems activated. The ships shimmered and, like mirages, seemed to fade into nothingness. Only faint outlines were visible, and soon even those disappeared. Back on the bridge of the Daedalus, Commander Ilias watched the last traces of the stealth ships vanish. A heavy sigh escaped him. May the stars guide them safely back to us, he murmured. Captain Carter aboard the Sentinel echoed the sentiment. They are our eyes and ears in the dark. All we can do now is wait and hope. The two cruisers settled into a tense vigil, surrounded by the quiet chaos of the asteroid field. Inside, Crews monitored instruments and maintained watchful eyes on Drac territories, waiting for any sign from the stealth ships. The void of space, so vast and indifferent, seemed to close in around them. Yet within this vast darkness, there was a sliver of hope, a glimmer of a chance to turn the tide against the Drac. The fate of the reconnaissance mission, of the galaxies at stake, now rested on the shoulders of those aboard the stealth ships, venturing into the heart of the unknown diplomacy amidst animosity. The setting sun cast a reddish hue over the meeting room located on the neutral moon base of Triax. This outpost, once a bustling trade hub, had seen better days, but now it served as the venue for a meeting of two formidable leaders, Solane and Zorvan. The door slid open with a hiss, revealing Solane, a tall, imposing figure with a stern face etched with lines of age and stress. Close behind him was Varro, ever vigilant. Across the room, framed by a window that showcased the vastness of space, stood Zorvan. 
His veritan form, lithe and silver-skinned, reflected the light in a way that almost seemed ethereal. The air was thick with tension, memories of old conflicts and betrayals echoing in the silence. But Selene was the first to break it. Zorvan, he greeted, voice cool, yet not without a hint of respect. Zorvan responded with a nod, his blue eyes fixing on Selene's. We meet in dire times, Selene. That we do, Selene acknowledged, moving to the center of the room. Our past is riddled with mistrust, but the Drac threat looms large. We need to set aside our differences. Zorvan's eyes glinted, the hint of a smirk on his lips. I remember a time when humans worked in the shadows, manipulating the Council to further their interests and diminish ours. A time when Veritans were pushed to the periphery. Salon stiffened. Those were different times, and our survival depended on it. But now, the stakes are higher. It's not just about Veritans or humans. It's about the very existence of our galaxy. Zorvan leaned forward, his voice taking on an icy tone. Your survival always seems to come at the expense of others. But tell me, why should we lend our fleet, only to be cast aside once the threat is over? Varro stepped forward, ready to intervene, but Selene raised a hand, signaling him to stand down. He met Zorvan's challenging gaze head on. Because, Zorvan, if the Drac win, there won't be a council to manipulate, nor worlds to vie for dominance. We will all be dust. The two leaders stared at each other the weight of their shared history and the imminent threat pressing down on them. Finally, Zorvan exhaled, breaking the tense standoff. Very well, but there are terms. I will command my fleet. They will answer to me, and only to me. Any orders from the Council will come through me. Do we have an understanding? Selene nodded slowly. Your terms are acceptable. In return, I promise to seek an amnesty for you, your generals, and your soldiers from the Council. It will stand until the Drac are defeated. Zorvan gave a curt nod, sealing the deal. Then let it be known that for this brief moment in history, humans and Veritans stand united. As their meeting concluded, the two leaders approached the window, the cosmos stretching endlessly before them, each star a beacon of hope and each void a reminder of the uncertainty they faced. Selene murmured more to himself than to Zorvan, the universe has a way of bringing foes together when survival is at stake. Zorvan replied, Yes, and perhaps in fighting together we may find a way to coexist long after the Drac are gone. In the vast expanse of the universe, amidst the tapestry of stars and darkness, two leaders pondered the future, united by a fragile truce and a shared resolve to face the coming storm. If you're new to this story, please check out the playlist in the description below and feel free to start from the beginning. Sailing into Darkness The galaxy's vast canvas of stars had been the backdrop for the stealth ship's journey over the past two days. Deeper and deeper into Drac territory they ventured, the weight of their mission growing with each passing moment. For Lieutenant Mira and Ensign Garo, aboard one of these ships, the vastness of space outside was matched only by the depth of their resolve. Mira's gaze remained focused on the ship's main display. They were fast approaching their fourth system, but the sights from the previous three had cast a long shadow over their journey. All three systems, once vibrant hubs of life and activity, now lay in ruin. Destroyed worlds, reduced to scattered debris and haunting echoes of civilizations lost. Garo broke the silence his voice subdued. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Entire worlds, just gone. Mira nodded, her expression pensive. The Drax might is unlike anything we've encountered. We've seen the aftermath of their rage in three systems already. We can't let that be our world's fate. As their stealth ship neared the fourth system, the sensors picked up a series of planets, and one, in particular, caught Mira's attention. Not because it was destroyed, but because it was teeming with life, albeit a life that seemed constrained. Bringing the ship to a discreet orbit around the inhabited planet, the two officers observed its surface. Massive Drac ships hung low, casting oppressive shadows over sprawling cities. From this distance, the world looked serene, its oceans shimmering under the light of its sun. But a closer look revealed a different story. Mira initiated a high-resolution scan, and soon images from the surface flooded their screens. Drac enforcers patrolled every major junction, their formidable presence evident even from space. 
The indigenous inhabitants moved with a purposeful haste, their actions reflecting an underlying tension, a silent oppression. They didn't destroy this one, Garo noted, his voice tinged with surprise. But by the looks of it, they might as well have. Mira agreed. It's a different kind of destruction, not of structures, but of spirit. Activating the ship's communications interceptor, they began to filter through the planet's broadcasts. Most were DRAC mandates, relayed with unyielding authority. Others were snippets of the planet's inhabitants, their conversations reflecting a mix of despair, resignation, and whispered hopes. We have to document everything, Mira said, adjusting her console to record the data. The Council needs to understand the DRAC's strategies. Their dual approach, obliterate or subjugate. Garrow worked silently alongside her, capturing every piece of information. Occasionally, his screen would showcase images of the planet's children watching DRAC propaganda, their young eyes filled with a mix of fear and confusion. It wasn't long before Mira decided they'd gathered enough from this system. Prepare to move out, she instructed, her voice determined. We need to cover more ground. As the stealth ship subtly adjusted its trajectory, preparing to plunge deeper into DRAC territory, Garrow turned to Mira. Lieutenant, there's hope still. These worlds, these people, they're a testament to the resilience of life. The DRAC might rule with an iron fist, but the spirit of resistance is alive. Mira looked out at the vast expanse, the stars glistening like distant beacons. You're right, Ensign, and it's our duty to ensure that hope isn't extinguished. Onward. With renewed purpose, the ship moved forward, deeper into the shadows of the Drac Dominion, carrying with it the hopes of countless civilizations. The Sensor's Whispers As the starlit void of space unfurled around the stealth ship, its sophisticated instruments constantly painted a picture of the galaxy's secrets. Yet, amidst this backdrop of cosmic marvels, a nagging inconsistency had begun to vex the crew. Lieutenant Mira sat contemplatively at her console, her fingers tracing the edges of a peculiar blip that refused to fade from their sensors. It's been hours, she murmured, mostly to herself. This shouldn't be here. Ensign Garrow, his brows furrowed in concentration, tried recalibrating the system. It's like a phantom signature, almost a whisper. It's there, but not quite. The ship's AI, a voice of calm amidst their rising concerns, chimed in. All systems are functioning optimally. The anomaly persists. Mira's eyes darted between the different readings. She had trained extensively for these missions, faced numerous simulations of potential DRAC countermeasures. But this, this was uncharted. Could the DRAC have tech that we aren't aware of? Something that mirrors our own sensor outputs? Garo hesitated. It's possible. Their conquests have given them access to a plethora of technologies, but why? What's the purpose of this echo? Their ship, always silent and unseen, continued its trek deeper into the heart of Drac Dominion. The vast interstellar canvas outside remained unchanged, but inside the vessel, a silent storm of doubt and determination raged. Throughout their journey, the anomaly played a game of cosmic hide-and-seek. At times, it would fade, becoming nearly indistinct, only to return with surprising clarity moments later. This ebb and flow became a relentless undertone to their mission, an uninvited guest in their odyssey into enemy territory. Mira, ever the pragmatist, made a call. Log it, monitor it, but we proceed as planned. Our mission remains unchanged. Garo nodded, though an unease lurked in his eyes. Understood, Lieutenant. Still, it feels like the universe is trying to tell us something. Their path was set, their resolve unyielding, Yet the persistent anomaly, like a shadowy specter, loomed in the backdrop. The ship pressed on, silently echoing the determination of its crew, while in the cold vastness of space, secrets whispered and waited. Hope amidst the shadows. After days more searching in Drac territory, the bleakness of desolation and oppression weighed heavily on the crew of the stealth ship. Every system they passed bore the brutal signature of the Drac's dominance. Devastated worlds, once vibrant and full of life, now lay barren, their very essence stripped away. In others, the once proud civilizations were mere shadows of their former selves, subjugated and forced into submission by their drac overlords. 
Lieutenant Mira, her hands steady on the ship's controls, maneuvered them through another star cluster, her keen eyes scanning the inky blackness of space for any signs of life or activity. Ensign Garo, beside her, was equally absorbed, his fingers dancing over the sensors, looking for any anomaly that might offer them a hint of what they sought. Suddenly, the silence of the cockpit was shattered by a beeping alert from the long-range sensors. Energetic discharges, unmistakably the signatures of weapons fire, blinked on their displays. Mira leaned in, her eyes narrowing at the sight. What have we got, Garrow? Garrow adjusted the sensor magnification. Two ships. One's Drac, but the other. I've never seen anything like it. Without hesitation, Mira rerouted their course towards the disturbance. As they approached, the scenario became clearer. A small drac ship, armed to the teeth, was in hot pursuit of a vessel of unfamiliar design. It was sleek and agile, moving with a grace that belied the scars and damage visible on its hull. The chase that unfolded before them was nothing short of epic. Despite the relentless barrage from the drac ship, the mysterious vessel danced and weaved through space with incredible skill. Every Drac salvo was expertly avoided or absorbed by the vessel's robust shields. Then, in a moment that took Mira and Garo's breath away, the fleeing ship changed tactics. From its sleek form, a burst of torpedoes rocketed forth, each finding its mark on the Drac vessel. The pursuer, caught off guard, suffered critical damage, its systems sparking and failing. But the unknown ship wasn't done. With a determination that spoke of deep-seated animosity towards the drac, it turned and unleashed another salvo. This time, there was no recovery for the drac ship. It exploded in a brilliant flash, illuminating the surrounding space with its demise. Mira and Garo exchanged stunned glances. In all their reconnaissance, they hadn't expected to witness active resistance against the drac. Garo finally found his voice. Who, who are they? Mira, her gaze still fixed on the sight of the drac ship's destruction, murmured, Friends, I hope. The mysterious vessel lingered in the vicinity for a time, perhaps assessing the damage or conducting repairs. After what felt like hours, it made its move. With an impressive display of energy, it activated its FTL drive and vanished, leaving a trail of light in its wake. We need to follow them, Mira declared, her tone resolute. They could be the allies we've been searching for. Garo nodded, quickly calculating the trajectory. Got it, they're headed towards the Helion Cluster. Mira engaged the ship's FTL drive. The stars outside blurred as they shot forward, pursuing the beacon of hope that had suddenly ignited in the vast, oppressive darkness of Drac-controlled space. Dire revelations. The vast emptiness of space, punctuated by the occasional twinkle of distant stars, served as a serene backdrop for two imposing cruisers the Sentinel, and the Daedalus. Hiding within the protective shadows of a sprawling asteroid field, the two behemoths maintained a hushed stillness, waiting. Without warning, the tranquil void was disrupted. A signal sparkled on the Sentinel's radar, indicating an incoming ship. The stealthy silhouette, built for discretion, was rapidly closing the distance, signaling an urgency. Gently touching down within the Sentinel's spacious shuttle bay, the craft was a marvel of stealth engineering. The landing bay doors hissed shut, sealing off the expanse of space outside. Almost immediately, the ship's hatch swung open and two individuals, Lieutenant Jackson and Ensign Ray, stepped out, their faces etched with a mix of exhaustion and concern. Captain Carter, the commanding presence of the Sentinel, flanked by his senior officers, stepped forward to meet the returning crew. Lieutenant Ensign, Carter acknowledged with a nod, your early return suggests urgency. Report. Jackson, taking a deep breath, responded, Captain, the intel we've gathered. You need to see this firsthand. Extending a data tablet, its screen swarmed with images, star charts, and intricate sensor data. As Captain Carter perused the data, the room's atmosphere grew heavy. The images revealed planets, some obliterated to nothingness, others scarred by the Drax tyranny. But what truly captured Carter's undivided attention was the footage of a colossal structure surrounded by Drac support crafts. Its very design seemed to scream destruction. A murmur ran through the assembled officers. That's the Star Killer, one whispered, vocalizing the collective dread. Ray, her voice tinged with gravity, elaborated. 
We managed to record its activation sequence, Captain. Its capabilities. They're unparalleled. We've never seen anything with such potential for devastation. Captain Carter's gaze met Ray's and then shifted to Jackson. The sheer significance of their discovery was not lost on him. This intelligence is pivotal. The Galactic Council needs to be informed immediately, he decided. Promptly, Captain Carter activated a secure comms link to the Daedalus. The holographic interface lit up, revealing Command Ilias. The exchange was brief. With shared data and a brief discussion, it was evident what had to be done. The Council must receive this intelligence as a top priority. While the Sentinel's crew hustled to ready the ship for rapid departure, Captain Carter turned to the wearied scouts. Your efforts could very well change the trajectory of this war. Rest and recover. You've done the Sentinel and the Galactic Council proud. Jackson nodded, fatigue evident in his posture. We did what we had to, Captain. Ray added, attempting a smile. We can only hope it makes a difference. With the stealth ship securely docked within, the Sentinel began its prep for FTL jump. Safely navigating its way out of the asteroid maze, it then aligned itself to its destination. A brilliant flare of light, and the ship was gone, soaring through space-time. The Daedalus remained, a lone Sentinel against the tapestry of the stars, awaiting the return of the two remaining stealth ships and the tales they might bring. The Helion Cluster Mira's fingers danced over the controls, the bright console casting a pale light onto her determined face. The helixes of stars outside the window seemed to blur and merge as they ventured further into the uncharted depths of the Helion Cluster. Garrow, as always, sat in composed silence, eyes fixed on the sensor display. The Helion Cluster, Garrow mused aloud. Folktales talk about lost ships and ghostly echoes in these parts. He glanced at Mira a wry smile playing on his lips. Makes you wonder why that unknown ship led us here. Mira smirked, adjusting their course slightly. Perhaps they're just big fans of ghost stories. But her jest was thinly veiled. They both sensed the weight of their mission, the high stakes of their journey. Hours seemed like minutes, and minutes like seconds. As Mira piloted the ship through the dense asteroid field, she couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. It was as if the very stars had eyes. A particularly large asteroid ahead caught their attention. Its unique mottled surface seemed almost artificial. That's where it went, Garrow exclaimed suddenly, pointing towards a trace on the sensor. The unknown ship's trajectory led directly to that massive asteroid. Yet now, there was no sign of it. It had simply vanished. Mira's curiosity flared. A hidden base, perhaps? She maneuvered their stealth ship closer, the mysterious asteroid looming larger in their viewport. Hours passed as they studied its surface, searching for any signs of an entrance or any hint of the ship they'd been tailing. Garo broke the silence. We can't just float here forever. The longer we stay, the more likely we'll be discovered, and not necessarily by friends. He was right. Mira made a decision. All right, she said resolutely. Let's introduce ourselves. Activating their communication array, she began a broad frequency transmission. To the inhabitants of the asteroid, or anyone listening, we are Lieutenant Mira and Ensign Garrow, representatives of the Galactic Federation. We come in peace, seeking allies against a common foe, the Drac. The transmission echoed out into the void. Minutes felt like hours as they awaited a response. Nothing just the silent vastness of space and the watchful gaze of the asteroid. Garrow's voice quivered with anxiety. Maybe it was a bad idea. We've just announced our presence. Mira, refusing to be disheartened, replied, It was a chance we had to take. But before another word could be spoken, an unsettling sensation enveloped them. The instruments began flashing in chaotic patterns. Garrow's eyes widened. We're trapped. Around them between the swirling asteroids, thin beams of light began to connect, forming an intricate lattice. It was a force field and they were ensnared in its grip. The field pulsed with an eerie energy, its tendrils creeping closer, leaving them with nowhere to run. Mira gritted her teeth, fingers clenching the ship's controls. Every training scenario, every drill they had been through, none had prepared them for this. For a moment, the weight of their isolation crushed them. Alone, in an unknown territory, 
surrounded by an unseen adversary. Yet when all seemed bleak, a voice crackled over their comm system, ethereal and strange. Galactic Federation? Very well. Prepare to dock. And just as suddenly as it had appeared, a section of the asteroid's facade shifted, revealing a vast entrance. The interior beckoned them, a cavernous expanse that seemed both ancient and advanced, bustling with activity. With a deep breath, Mira piloted the ship forward. They were stepping into the unknown, and the Helian Cluster's mysteries were only beginning to unravel. The Heart of the Cluster The massive bay doors sealed behind them with a reverberating thud, ensconcing their ship in semi-darkness, interrupted only by the occasional gleam of luminescent glyphs on the walls. The hangar seemed a cathedral to the cosmos, with tall arches and patterns resembling constellations. Beside her, Garrow began a series of rapid scans. No immediate threats detected, he murmured. But there's a lot of technology here I don't recognize. And the atmosphere outside the ship, it's breathable for us. Mira pondered momentarily, then resolved to step out. She needed answers, and they weren't going to come from staying within the confines of their vessel. Garrow gave a reluctant nod, and the two ventured forth, their footsteps echoing eerily. Before them stood an assembly, an eclectic mix of beings, some vaguely humanoid, others less so. Their appearances varied, from scales to skins of varying hues, and eyes that glinted with both curiosity and caution. In the center stood an imposing figure, not for its size, but for the aura it projected. Garrow and Mira instinctively understood this being was the leader, or at least their spokesperson. I am Silrex the figure intoned, its voice resonating with a timbre that was almost musical. Representative of the Helian Collective, you have entered our sanctuary, Galactic Federation beings. Why? Gathering her wits, Mira stepped forward. We seek allies, Silrex of the Helian Collective. The Drac Menace threatens all in its path, and we believe that together we might stand a chance against them. Silrex's multifaceted eyes assessed them glittering with myriad emotions. The Drac, yes, we are familiar with their tyranny, but why should we believe you? Why should we trust the Federation? Mira took a deep breath, recounting their pursuit of the unknown vessel and the destruction they'd witnessed in the Drac's wake. As she spoke, some members of the assembly whispered amongst themselves, others simply listened intently. When she finished, Silrex was silent for a moment, then spoke, your journey has been perilous, and your courage commendable. But understand this, Mira of the Federation, our mistrust isn't of you alone. The cosmos is vast, and not all its dwellers hold noble intentions. Garrow, usually so reserved, interjected passionately, The Drax ambition knows no bounds. They've left countless worlds in ruin. They've developed a weapon that can annihilate stars. If we don't unite now, there may not be a later. Murmurs rose from the assembly. It seemed the truth of the Drac's power was undeniable even here. Silrex raised a hand, quieting the room. We shall deliberate. In the meantime, you are our guests. You'll be provided quarters to rest. We will reconvene once a decision is reached. Mira gave a nod of gratitude. As they were escorted to their quarters by a Helian guide, the weight of the universe seemed to hang over them. They had extended the hand of friendship. Now, all they could do was hope the Helian Collective would grasp it. Once settled into their temporary accommodations, Mira stared out at the dazzling vista of the Helian Cluster. The silent ballet of stars and cosmic entities was awe-inspiring. It gave her a momentary pause, a brief escape from the weight of their mission. However, the serenity was interrupted by a soft chime at the door. Come in. Mira responded. The door slid open to reveal a Helian, distinctly different in appearance than Silrex, but equally captivating. She stepped gracefully into the room. I am Alira. She introduced herself, her voice imbued with a curious warmth. An ambassador of the Helian Collective. I've come to ask you some questions. Garrow and Mira exchanged a glance, sensing the gravity of the situation. The chapter of diplomacy had truly begun. A Game of Shadows The vast hall of the Galactic Federation Council was always an imposing sight, a blend of ancient architecture and cutting-edge technology. 
Suspended above the great round table was a vast holographic display, upon which danced the myriad stars and galaxies of known space. Today, it displayed the damning evidence brought back by the Sentinel. Captain Carter of the Sentinel stood firm, hands clasped behind his back, facing the representatives from countless planets. He had relayed the stealth ship's findings, and now, the data was playing out in gruesome detail for all to see. The Drax weapon, a monstrous construct capable of extinguishing stars, surrounded by its support fleet. A hushed murmur filled the hall, occasionally broken by gasps of disbelief and outrage. The weight of the revelation seemed to press down on the room, a palpable dread that every member felt. Counselor Terran, a figure of authority and wisdom in the council, was the first to break the silence. This is dire, our worst fears realized. And yet, Captain Carter, you risked all to bring us this intelligence. For that, you have our gratitude. Captain Carter nodded. The risk was necessary. The galaxy must know. Counselor Drain, always the skeptic, interjected. So we are to take action based on the findings of a lone stealth ship. How do we know this isn't some elaborate ruse by the Drac to divert our forces? Carter resisted the urge to bristle. The evidence speaks for itself, Counselor. Any delay might doom us all. The room erupted into debate. Accusations flew, alliances were tested, and long-standing grievances resurfaced. For hours, the Council clashed. Some members called for immediate military action, leveraging the full might of the Galactic Federation. Others pleaded for a diplomatic approach, hoping to negotiate with the Drac, fearing an all-out war might doom countless civilizations. Amidst the discord, a singular voice rose above the din, commanding attention. It was Grand Counselor Lorene. Her age and experience lent her an authority few could contest. Enough, she thundered. The room fell silent. We stand on the precipice of annihilation, yet we bicker like children. This evidence cannot be ignored. We must formulate a response. But what response? queried Counselor Vial. Do we rally our fleets and march to war? Or do we seek peace even now? Lyrene looked around the room, taking in the faces of her peers, seeing the fear, the hope, the resolve. We prepare for war, but we also send emissaries seeking dialogue. If the Drac can be reasoned with, we must try. But if not, we will stand ready. The council members nodded in agreement. It was a measured response, one that encompassed the varied opinions within the room. As the stars glinted in the vast expanse, wheels were set in motion. The fate of the galaxy teetered, and every decision now carried the weight of countless lives. The Lion's Den. The vastness of space around the Drac-controlled planet was a serene blanket of stars, dotted with the distant glows of celestial bodies. The third stealth ship, nestled against this backdrop, silently observed the planet below. Its crew, Lieutenants Rice and Lyra, were engrossed in their instruments, documenting Drac activities and fleet positions. Lyra, monitoring the communication streams, raised an eyebrow. The amount of encrypted traffic here is unusual. It's as if they're preparing for something big. Rice looked up from his piloting console. Hopefully it's not us they're preparing for, he remarked with a wry smile. Let's gather what we can and get out of here. We've overstayed our welcome. But just as they began plotting their exit trajectory, a sudden wailing of alarms pierced the ship's otherwise quiet ambience. On the main console, the proximity alerts blinked furiously in red, signaling multiple fast-approaching objects. What the- Lyra barely had time to voice her surprise as the visual feed displayed a terrifying sight. Emerging from behind the planet's moon was a Drac warship, its massive silhouette ominous against the stars. And from its flanks, a dozen smaller, nimble fighters spilled forth, fanning out with practiced precision. They were hiding behind the moon, using its shadow to mask their energy signatures, Rice exclaimed, his hands flying over the controls. Hang on! He veered the ship hard to starboard, desperately trying to gain distance. The Drac fighters, like a swarm of predatory wasps, closed in rapidly, launching plasma projectiles that left brilliant blue streaks in their wake. The stealth ship's evasive maneuvers made it a difficult target, but the sheer number of enemy ships meant it was only a matter of time before they found their mark. Lyra, her fingers dancing on her console, worked to jam the Drax targeting systems, giving them precious seconds. Rice, I've got an idea. 
If we can dive into the planet's ionosphere, the interference might buy us some time. But even as she spoke, the massive Drac warship fired a concentrated energy beam. A tractor beam. The stealth ship shuddered violently, its controls becoming unresponsive as they were locked into the beam's inescapable grip. Can't break free, Rice growled, frustration evident in his voice. The ship's thrusters flared in defiance, but the Drac technology was too advanced, too overpowering. In the waning moments before they were completely ensnared, Lyra initiated a burst transmission, directing it towards the last known location of the Daedalus. The message was short, desperate. Ambush! Drac trap! Coordinates attached! Send... The transmission cut off abruptly as the stealth ship was yanked into the Drac warship's vast shuttle bay. Inside, the atmosphere was cold, sterile. The bay doors closed behind them, sealing them in darkness. Rice and Lyra exchanged a grim look, the weight of their situation sinking in. They were prisoners in the heart of the Drac fleet, far from Federation space, with no certainty that their distress call had even reached its destination. Back on the Daedalus, the crew continued their vigil, hoping against hope for a sign from the stealth ships. If you're new to this story, please check out the playlist in the description below, and feel free to start from the beginning. The ambient hum of the Daedalus control room was abruptly shattered by the insistent beep of an incoming transmission. Commander Ilias, previously immersed in the steady rhythm of the ship's operations, instantly turned his attention to the main console. The transmission was garbled, muddled with interference, but a few coherent fragments punched through. Ambush! Drac trap! Coordinates attached! Send... The abrupt cutoff left a chill in the room. Recognizing Lyra's voice only intensified the tension. The coordinates embedded in the transmission marked a location dangerously deep within Drac territory. Gathering his senior officers quickly, Commander Ilias shared the fragmented message. It's from Lyra, he announced gravely, replaying the chilling transmission. Lieutenant Karras's face paled. Heading into Drac space based on this would be madness. We'd be diving headfirst into their trap. Commander Venn, typically stoic, exhibited visible distress. But that's Reese and Lyra. We can't just leave them. With the weight of leadership pressing down, Ilias responded, I know, but we can't act recklessly. We'll wait for Mira and Garrow. They have experience with the Drac. Maybe they can provide insight. Until then, Reese and Lyra are on their own. The stark reality of their situation loomed large. Outside the Daedalus's windows, the vastness of space seemed even more profound, its depths holding secrets both hopeful and dire. Captured and confined. The cold metal against his cheek was the first sensation Reese became aware of as he stirred back to consciousness. The oppressive darkness of the room was disorienting. Next to him, Lyra's breathing was ragged but steady, a small comfort amidst the uncertainty. Lyra? He whispered, voice hoarse, reaching out to touch her arm. The fabric of her uniform was torn, and beneath it he felt the warmth of her skin. Reese, she murmured, struggling to sit up. Where are we? The room was almost pitch black, save for a faint glow from a distant panel. The walls hummed and the floor beneath them vibrated ever so slightly. Telltale signs that they were still aboard a ship and given their last memory, likely the Drac vessel. On the Drac ship, I believe. Reese replied, trying to suppress the shiver of dread that thought provoked. The cell was small, the air stale. The ceiling was just low enough to make them feel even more confined. Lyra groaned as she tried to shift into a sitting position, every move revealing new aches. Are you hurt? Reese asked, genuine concern lacing his tone. I've had worse, she replied, trying to mask her pain. But we need to get out of here. They'll come for us soon. Reese nodded, pulling himself up to a kneeling position beside her. We need a plan. Our weapons are gone. But maybe if we can surprise them when they come in. He was interrupted by the harsh grinding of the cell door's lock mechanism. The room was bathed in a stark white light from the corridor outside, blinding them temporarily. Silhouetted against the glare stood two Drac soldiers, massive, armored, and intimidating. Before Lyra could react, one of the Drac lunged forward, grabbing Reese by the arm and yanking him to his feet. Lyra lunged forward, trying to fend off the soldier, but the second Drac was swift, delivering a blow that sent her crashing back to the floor. No! Reese shouted, trying to break free, but the Drac's grip was iron tight. 
As he was dragged out of the cell, he cast a desperate look back at Lyra, her figure shrinking away in the dimming light of the retreating corridor. Lyra, dazed and winded, could only watch as the door slid shut once again, plunging her into near total darkness. The muffled footsteps of the drac faded, leaving her alone with her racing thoughts and the foreboding hum of the ship. Reese, she whispered, a silent promise filling her heart. Whatever was coming next, they would face it together, and they would survive. The silence of the cell was punctuated only by the distant hum of the ship's engines and Lyra's own ragged breathing. She knew the drac wouldn't keep her waiting long. Whatever they wanted, they would come for it, and she needed to be ready. Summoning every ounce of her strength, Lyra began to assess her surroundings, seeking any possible advantage, no matter how small. The future was uncertain, but she would not go down without a fight. The room Reese was thrust into contrasted sharply with the cell. Brightly lit, with a single gleaming metallic table in the center, it bore all the hallmarks of an interrogation chamber. Restraining cuffs dangled ominously from one end. A lone figure stood at the far side, its back turned. As Reese was forcibly seated and cuffed to the table, the figure turned around, revealing itself to be a drac. But not just any drac. This one bore distinct markings on its armor, an officer, possibly high-ranking. Comfortable? The drac officer inquired, its voice dripping with mock concern. Its translator device, embedded in its armor, rendered its speech in a perfect neutral galactic common. Seeing no reason to respond, Reese simply glared back. The drac chuckled, a sound that managed to be both eerie and mirthless. Human resilience, I admire it. The drac began, pouring a glass of clear liquid from a decanter. Water? It offered, pushing the glass toward Reese. Suspicion flared in Reese's eyes, but his parched throat won over. He took a hesitant sip. It was water, surprisingly fresh. He took a deeper gulp, hoping it might stave off the dehydration headache he felt forming. The drac officer seemed pleased. My name is General Skarn. You and your kind are a curious bunch. Venturing into Drac territory, spying on our operations. Why? Reese remained silent, fixing Skarn with a defiant stare. Skarn sighed, a gesture eerily reminiscent of a human's. Your silence is expected, but futile. We have ways of making you speak. With that, he activated a device on the table. It emitted a low hum, and suddenly Reese felt an excruciating pain coursing through his body as if every nerve was on fire. The pain stopped as suddenly as it had begun. Reese was left gasping, sweat pouring down his brow. That was the lowest setting, Skarn said coldly. Why are you here? What is the Federation's interest in this sector? How many ships do you have stationed nearby? Skarn's questions were fired rapidly, each one accompanied by another jolt from the device, the intensity escalating each time. Reese bit back screams, fighting the urge to give in, his mind a whirl of pain and determination. But with every surge, his resolve wavered. In the adjacent cell, Lyra, though trying to steel herself, couldn't help but flinch with every muffled scream she heard. The harrowing sound of Reese's pain was nearly unbearable. Tears streamed down her face as she clutched the metal shard she had managed to pry from the bed frame. She pressed it against her palm, letting the sharp point dig into her skin, it served as a grounding sensation amid the chaos of emotion. She hid the shard beneath her uniform, ensuring it was concealed yet accessible. She felt an overwhelming urge to use it to save Reese, but the odds were heavily against her and the risks were high. The shard's presence, however, gave her a tiny flicker of hope. Whatever was to come, she wouldn't be completely defenseless. The distant screams continued each one echoing the desperation and suffering of the man she had come to respect and care for deeply. With every cry, Lyra's resolve to fight back only grew stronger. Sanctuary Among the Stars The ornate chamber Mira and Garo found themselves in was breathtaking. Intricate carvings and murals adorned the walls, chronicling a civilization's history in vivid, shimmering colors. The room was bathed in a soft, azure light, casting an ethereal glow on everything. At its center was a long, curved table with a holographic display, which currently showed a map of the known galaxy. Elyra, the Helian ambassador, stood tall and elegant, her features a mix of humanoid and something otherworldly. Her skin shimmered with a soft iridescence, and her eyes held depths of wisdom and sorrow. 
We have known of the Federation for quite some time. Alira began, her voice carrying the weight of countless histories. Centuries ago, when the Veritans committed their atrocities on your kind, we watched from the shadows, debating on whether to intervene. We chose silence, hoping that given time and space, humanity would evolve, heal, and rise. Garrow's brow furrowed. You knew of the human culling and did nothing? Elira's expression softened, her eyes filled with empathy. It was not a decision taken lightly, but we believed that sometimes societies must find their own path, make their own mistakes, and grow from them. It appears our hopes were well-founded as the Federation has flourished. And now perhaps it is time for our paths to merge. Mira, absorbing the weight of Elira's words, nodded slowly. We seek allies in our fight against the Drac. They've become a menace not just to us, but to the entire galaxy. Elira activated the holographic display, showing a series of planets. These were once Hellion worlds, teeming with life and our culture, but the Drac came and with them, destruction. As Mira and Garrow watched, the display illustrated waves of Drac ships descending on Hellion worlds, the skies ablaze with fire, cities toppling. The Drac's method is not just conquest, it's assimilation. They have a master race, the pure Drac, but they have subjugated many species, bending them to their will and integrating them into their war apparatus. Each conquered species has a function in Drac society. They erase culture, identity, everything that makes a race distinct, and reshape it to serve their ends. Garrow sighed. They use these other races as cannon fodder. Elira confirmed with a nod. Exactly, as workers, as slaves, and despite our advanced tech, We've always been pushed to the defensive because of the Drac's staggering numbers and their ruthless tactics. Mira's voice trembled with emotion. How have you managed to survive against such overwhelming odds? Alera's countenance reflected a deep-seated resilience. Our technology is a beacon of woe hope. Our defensive measures are cloaking capabilities. But it's a perpetual struggle, and perhaps with the Federation at our side, we can change the course of this war. A chime sounded and Elira broke off. I've been summoned. Please stay here. I'll return shortly. Silence enveloped the chamber, the gravity of the moment pressing on everyone's hearts. Facing a relentless enemy, the possibility of new allies brought a glimmer of hope. A hope that united, they could finally bring an end to the Drax reign of terror. Elira's footsteps echoed on the ornate marble floors as she walked back to the chamber where Mira and Garo awaited her audience with the Helian Council, a collective of the most esteemed minds and leaders of their civilization, had been long and filled with impassioned debates. They understood the gravity of the situation, for forming an alliance with the Federation was no minor decision. Entering the chamber, she found Mira and Garo standing, anticipation evident in their posture. Before they could ask, Elira held up her hand. The Council has reached a decision, she announced. Garrow's eyes bore into Elira's seeking answers. And? A momentary pause filled the room before Elira's lips curled into a smile. The Helians extend a hand of alliance to the Federation. We shall combine our strengths and stand united against the Drac. Mira's eyes glistened with emotion. This, this is the hope we've been searching for. Together we can change the fate of this galaxy. Elira nodded. I have been chosen as the emissary to bridge our worlds. I will accompany you back to the Federation and formally relay our council's decision. The room was awash with an optimistic energy. The possibility of an alliance, of shared resources, technologies, and strategies, represented a significant shift in the battle against the Drac. Yet, even amidst this burgeoning hope, the weight of responsibility pressed upon them. The path ahead would be fraught with challenges, but the promise of unity heralded a brighter future. As Mira and Garrow absorbed this turn of events, the scene shifted dramatically. The opulence and serenity of the Helian base gave way to the dark, foreboding interior of the Drac ship. In a dimly lit cell, the door slid open with a metallic groan, revealing two Drac soldiers. With a mix of disdain and amusement, they hurled a battered figure into the chamber. Reese hit the cold metal floor hard, pain racking his body with every movement. Lyra was on her feet in an instant, rushing to his side. Reese! Her fingers gently brushed his bruised face, her eyes widening in horror at the extent of his injuries. She could feel the heat from his inflamed skin, and her heart ached with every labored breath he took. 
With immense effort, Rhys managed to lock eyes with her. Lyra, he whispered, his voice trembling with pain and remorse. Tears pooled in Lyra's eyes as she cradled him. Shh, save your strength. But Rhys shook his head weakly, a tear trickling down his cheek. I couldn't withstand it, Lyra. Their methods, the torture, I broke. Lyra's heart constricted, understanding dawning. What did you tell them? She murmured, dread evident in her voice. Reese's gaze was tormented, filled with self-loathing. Everything. Federation positions, strengths, strategies. I betrayed us, Lyra. A sob escaped Lyra's lips as she pulled Reese close, enveloping him in a protective embrace. We'll find a way out of this, she whispered, her voice a mix of despair and determination. The stealth ship cut through the void, its engines humming softly as it neared the rendezvous point with the Daedalus. Mira glanced out of the viewport, her eyes searching the vast expanse of space, when a flicker of light caught her attention. It's the Helion shuttle, Garrow remarked, leaning over the console to get a better look. He squinted at the screen, a perplexed expression on his face. Strange. I can't detect it on our sensors. Mira frowned. How is that possible? Before Garrow could reply, Elira's voice echoed through the comms, smooth and confident. Our technology is a bit more advanced than what you're accustomed to. It might be difficult for your ship's sensors to detect my shuttle. Mira chuckled. Seems we still have a lot to learn. As they continued on their course, the serene journey was abruptly interrupted by Elira's voice, now laced with a hint of urgency. I'm picking up an echo on my sensors, and it's not from the Daedalus. Elira, what's going on? Mira inquired, her grip on the ship's controls tightening. Without responding, the sleek Helian shuttle banked hard to the right. Mira and Garrow watched, their hearts in their throats, as Elira's ship suddenly fired a barrage of energy pulses into the seeming void of space. An instant later, a small explosion erupted, illuminating a previously undetected object. What was that? Garrow exclaimed. Elira's voice returned, a touch of relief evident. A DRAC stealth tracker. It's designed to be silent, collecting data on non-DRAC tech. These drones don't transmit data. They have to return to their base to offload what they've recorded. Garrow's face paled. So it was spying on us. Mira clenched her fists. How long had it been following us? Elira responded. Not long, from what I can ascertain. Had it managed to return to DRAC territory, it would have delivered data on our location, potentially compromising the Helian Cluster's safety. Garrow let out a low whistle. That was too close for comfort. We owe you one, Elira. The Hellion's voice held a hint of amusement. Consider it the first installment in our newfound partnership. Let's proceed with caution. The Drac might have more surprises waiting for us. With the immediate threat neutralized, the stealth ship, flanked by the elusive Helian shuttle, continued its journey to meet with the Daedalus, now more vigilant than ever. Return to Daedalus. The shimmering metal exterior of the Daedalus came into view, a beacon of safety and familiarity amidst the uncharted black. Inside the stealth ship, Mira toggled the communication device, her fingers dancing over the controls. Commander Ilias. Her voice rang out, crisp and clear. We're approaching with company. A brief pause lingered before Ilias's voice resonated in response, a touch of concern evident. Explain. Mira took a deep breath, choosing her words carefully. We've made contact with a representative from the Helian Collective. She has critical information about the Drac. Ilias hesitated, the weight of the situation pressing heavily on him. Direct both vessels to Hangar Bay 2. Garo, listening intently, glanced at Mira, nodding in approval. Here's hoping this goes smoothly. As the stealth ship descended, flanked by Alira's sleek Helian shuttle, the bay doors hissed open to reveal the vast expanse of the hangar. Immediately, Mira's gaze was drawn to a squadron of marines, their armor gleaming under the overhead lights, weapons at the ready. Their posture was one of alertness, but not aggression. The stealth ship touched down softly, its landing gear absorbing the gentle impact. Elira's shuttle followed suit its movements fluid and almost ethereal. As the gangway descended, Mira and Garrow stepped out, met by the watchful eyes of the marine contingent. 
Elira emerged from her shuttle, her figure imposing yet graceful. Her appearance was alien, yet her demeanor exuded an air of regality and authority. The Marines, sensing her peaceful intent, relaxed their stance, although their vigilance remained. I am Elira of the Helian Collective, she began, her voice echoing through the hangar, drawing the attention of everyone present. I come bearing knowledge and a plea for unity. A Marine officer stepped forward, his voice respectful but firm. Commander Ilias will see you now. Without hesitation, Elira nodded. Time is of the essence. Mira and Garrow exchanged a glance, realizing the gravity of what was about to transpire. As they trailed behind Elira, the hangar doors slid closed behind them, sealing away the outside world. Within moments, they were ushered into Commander Ilias's office, the atmosphere thick with anticipation. Ilias rose from his chair, his gaze fixed on Elira. Welcome to the Daedalus, he said, a touch of uncertainty in his voice. I hope the information you bring is worth the risk. Ilira met his gaze unwaveringly. It is, Commander. The fate of our galaxy may very well hang in the balance. Revelations and desperate measures. The room was dim, lit only by the soft glow of a holographic projector. Commander Ilias sat rigidly at the head of the table, his face a canvas of concern. On his right, Mira and Garo leaned forward, their expressions a mixture of anticipation and anxiety. Opposite them, Elira stood tall, her fingers dancing over the controls of a small device she'd placed on the table. As you know, the Drac are not just a passing threat, she began, her voice cold and measured. The holographic display sprang to life, revealing a detailed star map. Bright red dots illuminated various sectors, each representing Drac forces or occupied planets. Their reach extends far and wide, and they move with purpose. Mira's eyes darted across the display, noting the vast territories under Drac control. The scope was overwhelming. Elira continued, We, the Helian Collective, have tried to resist, but our numbers are fewer. Each attempt to counteract their advances is met with swift and overpowering retaliation. As she spoke, brief clips of space battles displayed, showcasing the Drac's overwhelming might against the Helian's valiant but outnumbered fleet. Garrow clenched his fists, anger seeping into his voice. Why haven't we heard of these encounters? Elira's gaze settled on him. Because every time we make a move, they counter with even more force. We've had to be cautious, secretive even, for the sake of our people. Commander Ilias leaned forward. What can we do? In response, Elira placed a small, intricate device on the table. It pulsed lightly, emitting a soft blue hue. This, she began, is a Drac gravimetric wave detector. Their drones emit a unique gravimetric wave. They've likely been sending these drones to spy on you, gathering intelligence for their next move. Mira's eyes widened. You mean we've been infiltrated? Elira nodded gravely. It's their modus operandi. Before they strike, they gather as much information as possible. This device, and others like it which we can help you manufacture, will detect these drones. Commander Ilias picked up the device, inspecting it closely. How soon can we get these deployed across the Federation? Elira hesitated for a moment before responding. With your resources and our knowledge quickly, but we must act without delay. As the weight of the Drac infiltration settled in the room, Commander Ilias exhaled slowly. His gaze shifted to Mira and Garo, a hint of sorrow in his eyes. Before we move forward with our countermeasures, there's something else you should know. Both Mira and Garo straightened, sensing the change in his tone. The other stealth ship, the one you didn't find in the shuttle bay, was on the Sentinel. They returned with news of the star-killing device. The Sentinel has already left to inform the Federation. Mira's voice was tentative, fearing the answer to her next question. And Reese and Lyra? Commander Ilias's pause was telling. He finally replied, his voice thick with emotion. They've been captured. Mira and Garo exchanged a horrified glance, the weight of their friend's predicament evident on their faces. Regaining his composure, Commander Ilias spoke with renewed determination. Given everything we now know, we must act swiftly. I've already set a course for the Galactic Council at top speed. We'll inform them, seek reinforcements, and pool our resources. With the Helian Collective on our side, we may yet have a fighting chance. Elira, sensing the depth of their despair, 
spoke softly. Together we have a chance. Divided we fall. Now more than ever, unity is our greatest weapon. The Turning Point Commander Ilias took a moment to let everything sink in. The revelations from the Helian ambassador had been staggering. Every piece of intel Elyra had shared was not just significant, it was transformative. An enemy once shrouded in darkness had been brought to light. In the grand strategy room of the Daedalus, officers and advisors still engaged in fervent discussion about the intelligence. The soft hum of the ship and the distant murmurs of strategizing voices created a constant undertone, highlighting the magnitude of what was to come. Elyra stood off to one side, her lithe figure composed, yet emanating an aura of quiet determination. Ilias approached her. Ambassador Elyra, your presence here and the information you've given us might well be the pivot on which the fate of the entire galaxy turns. She inclined her head, a small smile playing on her lips. Commander, we in the Helian Collective have always believed in the power of collaboration. The Drac may have numbers and strength, but unity, resilience, and intelligence are on our side. He nodded, clasping his hands behind his back. The technology you've provided, the ability to detect those Drac drones, it's invaluable. And the intelligence on their positions and numbers, it's a clarity we've been lacking. Her eyes shimmered with a fusion of hope and resolve. Commander... This isn't just your fight or ours. It's a battle for every being in this galaxy. An alliance between our two factions could mark the beginning of the end for the Drac tyranny. He took a deep breath. We've been in the dark for too long. And I have a feeling that, with your help, the tide is about to turn. Commander Ilias retreated to the sanctity of his ready room. The dim lighting offered solace from the intensity of the past hours. He needed to communicate with the Galactic Command to inform them of this newfound alliance and the strategic advantages it presented. Sitting down at his desk, he initiated a secure line. The Federation's emblem glowed briefly on the screen before being replaced by the familiar visage of Admiral Aaron, his expression tense but always welcoming. Ilias, he greeted. I hope you have some good news. Admiral, Ilias began, his tone serious yet filled with a hint of optimism. We might have just encountered the turning point in our war against the Drac. He recounted the encounter with Elyra, the intelligence she provided, and the potential of the Helian Collective's technology. The Admiral listened intently, his eyes widening occasionally as the weight of the revelation became apparent. By the time Ilias concluded, the Admiral was silent for a few moments. This, this could change everything. We've been flying blind, and now if what you say is accurate, we've been handed a map and a compass. Ilias nodded. I believe an official meeting with Ambassador Elyra is in order. The Federation needs to understand the gravity of this potential alliance. Admiral Aaron agreed. Arrange it. I want to meet this Helian ambassador. With the communication ended, Ilias leaned back in his chair, staring out at the vastness of space. The star-studded canvas seemed a little less intimidating now. The Federation was no longer alone in its desperate fight. And as the Daedalus sped towards the Galactic Council, Ilias felt, for the first time in a long while, a spark of genuine hope. An alliance with the Helian Collective might just be the beacon of light they had been searching for.